I now call to order the regular session meeting of the Board of Commissions of the City of Tarver Springs on Tuesday, June 25th, 2019, 2019, 2019 at 6.30 p.m. Roll call, please. Mayor Lahuzis? Here. Vice Mayor Tara Panny is absent and excused. Commissioner Sieber? Here. Commissioner Carr? Here. Commissioner Donovan? Here. Tonight's invocation will be given, given by Reverend Tunnel from the All Saints Episcopal Church. If you please stand and remain standing. Also for the presentation of the flag <clears throat> by Tarpa Springs Public Safety, Honor Guard, and for the Pledge of Allegiance. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, send down upon those who hold office in this city the spirit of wisdom, charity, and justice that with steadfast purpose they may faithfully serve in their offices to promote the well-being of all people. Amen. <clears throat> Present the flag. Present the, the colors. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Please be seated. We are now going to the public comments on the items that will not be discussed tonight. If you have any comments, please come forward, state your name and your address for the record, and you'll be given four minutes. Thank you. Good evening, Anita Protus, 901 Bayshore Drive. I'd like to know where our sponge boat is, the Tarpon Spring sponge boat. And will, when will it return to the docks? It's been gone for quite a while. I know it's being repaired, but how long does it take? It's been gone for a long time. And uh, we have a lot of tourists down there. And it needs to be there. Does anyone have an answer? As soon as it gets fixed. <laughs> but how long? They've had it for quite a while. We'll get it back as soon as it's ready to come back. That's a vague answer, but that's okay. There's no date. Well, I'll go. I'll call me tomorrow. I'll ask and see where we are. All right. The second thing is, what liability do we have as a community without a lifeguard at our municipal beach? Uh, I go out there in the evenings and on weekends to drink my coffee, my tea, watch the sunset. It's beautiful. But where the boats come in to the trailers, there's people swimming out there and children and all over, and we do not have a lifeguard watching. They do have one at uh, Fred Howard Park Beach, but it doesn't help us. What liability are we uh, looking at without a lifeguard at the beach? Thank you. I'll get back to you. Well, it's an important thing. We it haven't had important. one for a it while. Is. And it's the safety important. of the people there. You're right. It is important. And I was, uh, when it hit me in my brain, I said, oh, my God, how long it's been yeah. since we've it's had one. Important. Well, these are things we have to think about for the community. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comments?
My name is Andreas Salivaras for 95 Riverside Drive. I want to come publicly to say thank you. Finally, one commissioner who started to pay attention to the spandex. The commission would really pay attention after so many years, we push him. I'm talking behalf subcommittee for the Spandak. Is rare. You don't mind if I call you with the first name. He involved with the subcommittee. And the first thing is he put in banners. The city that he moved the banners and the finally, I think two weeks or three weeks, we put it back two weeks, the banners for the Spandax. Secondly, we tried to put a lights who is willing and the subcommittee with the Spandax Association to put our own lights to make more visible the Spandax. I mentioned a long time ago, the Spandax group the city commissioners, I'm talking for the new commissioner, they neglect it. They never pay attention. And I talked to the Rea many times. <coughs> I say, Rea, why the Span Ducks wouldn't do something better? And I want to thank you, city manager, because she listened to me a couple times. Not because only for Andrea Salivara, because I own restaurants in the Spandax, but they all hold Spandax for everybody, not only for me. But lately, the commission, they ignore the Spandax. I don't want to mention, I don't want to mention the names of Mr. Donovan <coughs> or Mr. Karen or Mr. Tarapanis. And I'm gonna say what I think about, because it's not fair, because I know you, all of you, so many years. And I'm gonna say we have the private club, the commissioners. This is not unfair. But I'm gonna to say tonight, on behalf of the sub, Subcommittee of the Span Ducks, who is involved, rare. We need uh, so many things in the Span Ducks, special lights. Don't ignore it. Because every place we go, any city we go, especially the main street, we have a lot of lights. We used to have a lot of pots with the flowers. We remove it for some reason. I want you, I'm telling you tonight, and I wanted to, the city commissioners and the city mayor to pay a little bit of attention. And then publicly, I'm gonna repeat one more time. I wanna thank you, Rhea, because you First time, for after so many years, she said, yes, we have to support the Spandex. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Salivaras, and uh, I hope you stay here a little longer because item number 10 is pertaining to the sponge ducks. So I think it's something that you'd be interested to hear. Thank you very much. Any other public comments? My name is Donnie Williams. Um, I don't have an actual address, a P.O. Box 1122 in Tarpon Springs. But um, I come here today to, uh, to address, you know, like the kind of the, well, the harassment going on in the um, the black minority neighborhood. You know, it's a situation that's, you know, kind of out of hand, you know, pretty much out of hand. It's not kind of, 
you know, and something needs to be done about that. I have actual footage, you know, I put in complaints and, you know, it's something that needs to be addressed here in this community. So, I mean, where do we go from here? Thank you for your comment. Okay. Hi, my name is John L. Lee Jones. I stay at 1217 Normandy Drive. And also I have a complaint about the cops, a lot of harassing. I've been working for almost 20 years and I went to the cap center to pick up my son and a cop pulled me over. The first thing he said was, you know why I pull you over? Cause you didn't have your seat belt on. I said, okay. He said, you have your license on you? I said, well, sir, I do have gun license but I think my gun is in my glove box and I don't want to reach for it. He said, okay, give me your name, social security number, and everything will be okay. He comes back to the vehicle and goes, Mr. Jones, step out the vehicle, and I asked why. He said, well, just step out the vehicle. I said, why? The other cop come to the car and pull the gun on me. He said, get out the car. I said, why? He goes, you've been detained, and I asked why. He said, well, we're looking for your weapon. I said, well, I have a gun license, so why would you looking for it? So he goes through my vehicle, and so long, he finds some marijuana. He tell me the reason why he's in my car because he's looking and he find marijuana. So they want to charge me with the marijuana they find in my car. For your proper cause of pulling me over for the seatbelt. And I told him, my son go to school right there. I haven't smoked, I just got off of work. I was harassed in front of my son and handcuffed and then they let me go. Three weeks, a couple weeks later, I'm down at a party. Two girls get in a fight. Cops come over, pull out shotguns, guns everywhere. Two girls get in a fight now. There's kids everywhere. He tell everybody to get out of the way, get back, get back. He pulls the gun out on the kid, tell the kid you need to get out my face, get in the car and leave. Why so aggressive? And I'm starting to wonder with the Tarpon Spring Police Department, if a cop pull you over and tell you he smelled marijuana and he doesn't find nothing, what happens to the cop? You got a right to just search my vehicle because you say you smell marijuana? Oh, we do have dogs. So why the cops got a right to just tell you I smell something and I can search? Is that violating any laws, or you just have the right to do whatever you want to do at any <coughs> given time? So if you don't smell marijuana, would a cop go to jail? Would he get any charges, or he just brush up under the rug? Nobody? No answers? This thank is a American. We just... It, no, no, no. It, I want to thank you for your comment. It, it's public comment though and typically we don't reply to public comment so this is you just come and make a statement during public comment and we can follow up afterwards if you want to follow up with the commissioner or the city manager or the police chief but typically we're, there's not a going back and forth so I, I, oh, I don't want to go person. back and forth I just was wondering what anything happens to the cop or do they just have the right to just say I smell something and don't use the dog is that a legal search you can't answer those questions sorry well, thank you very much, but the police chief is right here. He's listening to you. Uh, Nobody answered. Comments. He will get back with you later. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. I just can't do that right now. Thank you. Do we have any other comments? Well, thank you very much. The uh, first item on the agenda is a proclamation. City of Tarpon Springs proclamation, whereas honor guard across the United States serve with honor, dignity, and royalty. And whereas honor guards demonstrate high regards for the uh, traditions of the United States military, public safety organizations, and other agencies, and honor the veterans who serve our country. And whereas honor guards are comprised and courageous men and women who have served in the military, law enforcement, fire service, public safety and emergency and medical service, and would ask all those who wear the uniform understand the sacrifice and the wilderness face, those risk every day in order to create a safe nation and communities for all Americans, and would ask honor guards serve our communities through participation in service for the fallen, presenting the colors with honor and involvement in the community memorials, and would ask this is an opportunity for the city of Tarpon Springs to recognize the services and sacrifice and show appreciation to the honor guard. And now therefore, I crystal who is by the virtue of the authority vested in me, 
as the mayor of the city of Tarpa Springs, Florida, do hereby proclaim June 29, 2019 as Honor Guard Day. And I'd like to uh, invite the Honor Guard to receive the proclamation. You want to say a few words? Oh, no. Okay. <laughs> Are there any commission comments? I hear none. Are there any public comments on this item? Hear none. We are now going to the item number two, which is the Independence Day, Commissioner Sieber. Yes, City of Tarpon Springs, Florida, proclamation. Whereas on this anniversary of the signing of our Declaration of Independence, we pay tribute to the courage and dedication <coughs> of those patriots who established our great country. And whereas we celebrate the values of justice and equality that strengthen our country. And whereas in celebrating our country's cherished independence, we should not only take pride in our vibrant history, but also look at the future with hope, confidence, and grace. And whereas we offer immense gratitude to all the patriots of both our past and present who have sought to advance freedom, establish virtue, and build foundation of peace. Because of their sacrifice, this country remains a beacon of hope for all who dream of a life filled with liberty, justice, and happiness. Now, therefore, I, Commissioner Rhea Sieber, Sieber, by virtue of the authority vested in the mayor of the city of Tarpon Springs, Florida, do hereby proclaim July 4th, 2019 as Independence Day. And this will be mailed. Thank you. Are there any commission comments? Are there any public comments on this item? Here, none. Thank you. And we are now going to the, pres to the presentation. Item number three is the presentation, FEMA firm map updates by uh, Mark Casellan, Director of uh, Hydraulics and Coastal Modeling Intra -geo Geoscience and Engineering Solutions. Good evening, Mayor, Commissioners. I'm going to go ahead and introduce you to uh, Dr. Gosselin, he's the Director of Hydraulics and Coastal Modeling for Inter, Inter Corporation. He's been a coastal engineer with 29 years of experience modeling coastal storm surge and climate, a uh, wave climate associated with hurricanes. Dr. Gosselin is a registered professional engineer in Florida and Louisiana, and he holds degrees from Dartmouth College, University of California, Berkeley, and the University of Florida. He's going to go ahead and talk about the firm map updates. Uh, thank you for inviting me to speak today. Uh, I'm going to talk about the uh, changes that are in store associated with your uh, flood insurance rate maps or firms. Uh, first, why are the uh, insurance rate maps being updated? Well, our understanding of flood risk changes over time. Uh, the current effective study, the current uh, effective uh, flood maps um, are based on outdated hurricane model modeling, uh, as well as outdated topographic data. Um, our ability to more accurately define risk, uh, and, or, uh, they're changing so that we uh, can improve our ability to more define risk uh, and account for the significant development that has occurred throughout the county. Um, Additionally, by uh, getting a better, more complete, and current picture of coastal flood risk, uh, this helps communities plan for this risk, communicate the risk to your citizens, uh, take action to reduce flood risks, uh, uh, or the flood risk to lives and property, as well as allows us to build safer and smarter. So the current 
uh, maps are based on surge modeling that was done approximately three to four decades ago. Um, uh, it was done back in 1979 uh, for the update that was published in uh, the early 80s. Um, at that point, th it was based on uh, <coughs> hurricane climatological data uh, up through 1977. So um, with the new maps, your risk will be better defined through updated elevation data. Our surveying uh, acquisition is, is much better than it was uh, back in the uh, late 70s. New climatological data based on the recent 40 years since the study had been done. Uh, updated uh, coastal hazard methodologies uh, and procedures, modeling. Computer resources have changed significantly since the 70s, as I'm sure I don't have to, to remind you all. Also, there's been improvements to uh, GIS technologies that allow the mapping to occur on a more consistent basis. So just to uh, review a little bit as, as to what you look at when you look at a, a flood insurance rate map, um, what the map is uh, telling you in terms of elevations are a combination, no, it's not that one, okay, a combination of the red line, which is the still water elevation, that's the elevation to which the surge rises as the hurricane comes in, um, adds to the wave height, which becomes the blue line, the dashed blue line, okay? So what you're looking at when you look at the elevations of the map are the height of the wave associated with that one in 100 year or 1% chance of occurrence per year storm, okay? If the wave heights are above three feet, it's, it's designated as a VE zone. Uh, the V stands for velocity uh, with a recognition that waves above three <laughs> feet will create significant velocities uh, uh, in those areas, and as such, commensurate damage. Below three feet, it's de designated as an AE zone. Uh, the AE zone is divided between uh, uh, waves between three and a foot and a half feet, and then waves between a foot and a half and, and zero feet uh, by a new feature called the LIMWA, or limit of wave action. So these designate the different areas and different building codes and insurance rates apply uh, within each designation. So where are we in the process of updating the maps? Uh, the study was started back in uh, 2012, uh, and then over the uh, intermediate uh, five years there, uh, there's been various accomplishments in terms of completing those studies. We are currently, Uh, in the appeal period. So the preliminary maps have been developed and are available um, publicly uh, for comment. Uh, come July 31st, they will close the comment and appeal period. And then we can expect these new maps to become effective sometime around the winter or spring, depending on the resolution of the comments during this period. We've been uh, uh, contracted by the county to review the maps to make sure that they uh, follow uh, FEMA procedures for accuracy uh, as, as well as methodology. Um, the review itself took several steps, uh, including uh, a preliminary review, a parcel level analysis, where we looked at the changes on a par parcel by parcel basis. We did a countywide review, which included documentation review, comparing the maps before and after, uh, as well as all the model inputs and outputs. And then uh, a detailed review, which includes uh, several aspects. In terms of your community, um, happy to report that uh, only 13% of the properties uh, within Tarpon Springs uh, will experience some uh, change in uh, zone designation or base flood elevation which would essentially result in an increase. So it's an either an increase in zone designation or an increase in base flood elevation. So I had mentioned that the uh, current maps were based on, on modeling that was done back in the 70s. 
I just wanted to give you all a, a quick flavor as to what sort of improvements are associated with the current maps. Uh, the uh, picture on the right is, um, it represents the modeling that was done in the 70s. Each of the squares represented one of those computational domains. So the, um, you can tell this is Gordon Pass down in, in southwest Florida. Uh, that we're doing, that back in the 70s it was a rather coarse, rough job as to how they uh, resolved storm surge. Here's an example of Stuart. Uh, the one on the left is the old modeling, and the one on the right, if you can see all the little dots associated with those, that's the resolution of the new modeling. Just to give you a flavor as to how much more resolved the new modeling is. And this is actually the model associated with, your, with uh, uh, Pinellas County. So you can see um, the resolution associated with uh, this new modeling. In addition to that, the modeling that was performed in the 70s did not include any wave modeling. They simply assumed a wave climate based on the depths of the surge. Back around 2000 when they revised the maps then, they did solve for wave climate, but only along the Gulf Coast and not along the Interior Bay Coast. So the latest map represents uh, uh, more accurate wave modeling along uh, both sides of Pinellas County. This map shows what's happening across your city in terms of changes in flood map elevation. So the hatched areas uh, are areas where there are increases in zone. I know it's kind of hard to see based on the color of this map, but it, these changes in zone are, are primarily um, focused around the coastline where uh, we have changes between AE and VE zones. Uh, but in general, most of the county shows green contours. The contours represent changes in base flood elevation. Um, so much of the county will see a decrease in base flood elevation. Um, why is this happening in, in, in this city along the Gulf Coast here? The main reason is uh, this area has been very blessed in that uh, it's been relatively quiet 40 years. Um, hurricane climatology has been relatively quiet. And that has made its way into the study by a reduction in the probability of these larger storm events in this area, simply based on what's, what's happened over the, the intermediate, intermediate uh, 40 years there. So if you're interested in taking a look specifically at your own properties, uh, the Pinellas County website uh, is a great resource, uh, pinellascounty.org slash flooding. You should turn off the uh, cell phone, please. <laughs> <It's trying. laughs> if, you, if you start at, at that page um, and click, I'm sorry, Alex, click the FEMA firm updates button on the left, uh, you'll come to this page uh, where uh, there will be a yellow box containing two choices, uh, the quick view and the detailed view. If you click the quick view, you can zoom into your individual properties uh, this actually has a slider bar, which you can uh, toggle back and forth between your current effective insurance rate maps and the preliminary maps associated with the new study. If you go to the detailed view, uh, you can click your property and it will tell you uh, what changes in the dialog box that comes up, what, what changes there are to your property in terms of zone and elevation. So as far as our review uh, goes, we've completed uh, much of it at this point. We're, we're uh, putting the final touches on our, on our detailed review. Um, throughout the county, we uh, did a detailed review of uh, the wave modeling along uh, approximately 90 transects, uh, a few of which, how many do we have here? Nine? Okay, uh, so we had several here. Uh, and in fact, um, one of them uh, revealed uh, an area that, that we're going to recommend for change. Uh, the, let me see, make sure I get this, the Bayshore Heights. Is this, does that ring a bell? Yeah. Uh, that area itself, um, I guess, has been recently developed. And as a result, uh, the mapping reflects 
uh, the old condition, and we're going to recommend that they alter the mapping to reflect the new condition along that parent side. So the next steps uh, between now and, and the 31st, uh, we <coughs> close the summer, or we finish collecting. Today is the deadline for submitting uh, your um, summary of map amendment or map action, rather, uh, uh, to include uh, letters of map change, which may have not been addressed uh, in the ones that were sent to you by FEMA. Uh, and we're finalizing our, our detailed review and transmitting our comments to FEMA. Uh, if we deem there is a reason for an appeal, uh, we will prepare it as appropriate. Um, and we had a public meeting earlier today. That's why that's there. So I'll remind you that there are resources available on uh, the Pinellas County webpage under flooding. And at this point, if there's if have any questions. Thank you, uh, Dr. Cosella. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, the question that I have is the data that we use now is 30 to 40 years old. And the with the new data that we have, and hopefully it will be updated more often, uh, what effect is going to have with the builder code? What effect is it, is it going to have on the building codes? That's a little outside of my It's not going to have an effect on the building code itself. It's going to have an effect on how we develop in the communities. So as the maps change, if we get a, uh, um, an area that was an AE, it's going to go to an X. It's going to change how we build on that particular parcel. But the building code itself isn't going to see a change. They, they address flooding within the building code since it's a statewide code. Okay. So the the residents expecting to see some changes for their uh, for their areas, then, right? Yes, there's going to be several changes here, um, and and more for the positive than the negative. I think it's 13 percent that's going to go uh, it's, it's negative. An adverse change. Right. So only 13 percent. on an A zone than the AE coastal lays. Okay. Thank you. Any uh, commission comments? No, I just want to thank you for the presentation and um, and it's nice to inform our citizens where to go to for uh, for information. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the presentation. I don't know if our uh, building director or the city manager could answer this, but are any of the city insurance plans going to be affected by this positively or, or negatively for any of the city properties? Are those getting rezoned, or are we just not sure yet until it comes out? Right now it's a preliminary mapping, and it will affect some of our properties. will uh, go to the better um, in, in some areas. I'm not sure about every single uh, property we have, we would have to go ahead and look at that and see what the changes are going to be. Okay. Thank you. That's it. Thank you. Any public comments on this item? Are there any public comments on this item? Here, none. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next item, number four, is another presentation for the Public Art Committee. Ms. Jenick. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, Board of Commissioners. Uh, this is the Tarpon Springs Public Art Committee annual report. Uh, we've been working diligently to uh, put together some uh, summary of what we've accomplished this past year and to uh, project some of the projects we're considering. Our accomplishments this year have been the installation of 17 artistic bike racks around town, uh, installed the Glenna Goodacre Nyad sculpture grouping in the roundabout at the west end of the Dodecanese Boulevard that included a water feature, revised the public arts brochure to reflect our recent accomplishments, and assisted the city in design for gateway signage at several key highway access points to Tarpon Springs. This is the uh, plan for our proposed budget. Um, we are putting the finishing touches on several projects. 
We are following up on the Board of Commissioners' comments requesting a historic mural and two other large murals painted by local artists. We are encouraging interest in the arts by proposing a scholarship to be set up for TARP and art students. Artist plaques will identify the individuals who created the bicycle racks. They'll be done in late aluminum. And creating heavy bronze plaques for the more substantial projects like the naiads, the sunburst murals, etc. The Ama Mermaid on the bayou is in dire need of repair due to environmental issues. In order to secure the best and most qualified artists for every PAC project, the city has been utilizing CAFE, the nationally recognized art mart. We've economized this year by printing the public art brochures in-house. That mechanism also allows for frequent updates as necessary. Our projects are deserving of public and press to announce the strides made in advancing all of the uh, projects in Tarpon Springs, thus the budget for the unveiling event. Some of the newer projects we're proposing is um, a artist alley. The public art committee is charged by uh, our ordinance with using high standards of artistic endeavors and were chosen on their experience and creativity. The city and the board of commissioners has charged us with creating new creative and innovative projects that while utilizing the imagery and cultural icons distinct to Tarpon Springs, will set it apart from the rest of the municipalities in Pinellas and indeed the state. We are proposing a unique art destination, Artist Alley, creating murals by local artists, many of which can be interactive, on the alleyway behind the stores on Tarpon Avenue that connects Hibiscus to the bike trail on Safford. We are considering a major mural on a wall of a private building possibly at the entrance to Hibiscus, we're still exploring locations, that would possibly be the focal point and jewel that would attract pedestrians to the alley. With a nod to the recently created Sustainability Committee, we envisioned a metal pl mesh plastic recycling creature, somewhat known, sometimes known as a goby fish, on Sunset Beach, as well as a more substantial steel tarpon sculpture. Again, using solar power, illuminated art boxes would not only light a walkable path, but create a mechanism for displaying local art that can be changed out at a very low cost on a monthly or bi-monthly basis, including the Board of Commissioners' suggestion that we utilize vintage holiday cards and art around the bayou. The Elizabeth Indianas historic mural incorporates many facets of Tarpon Springs history and a beautifully imagined mural. We hope to locate the mural on an appropriately significant location and have explored various media so that should the location experience a sale or other issues, the mural can be moved intact to another site without damage. These are, such, these are just a few draft examples of what some of the artist alley murals would look like. The Board of Commissioners expressed an interest in interactive murals that would serve as backdrops for selfies that would promote Tarpon Springs by visitors and locals on social media. Plastic waste in or near waterways is an international concern. We are proposing a lightweight, low-cost mesh plastic recycling receptacle artistically done that would be easily dumped by public works employees. The project would be done by a local metal artist, as possible one huge object or several smaller ones to create a grouping. The city manager and public works would be consulted on design specifications that would ensure that pickup and disposal would be efficiently accomplished. Solar powered illuminated art boxes would take Tarpon into a new realm of creativity. The boxes would be created like frames with a solar array at the top mounted on a metal pole or bollard. We envision that the images would be approximately 20 by 30 inches and would be illuminated from behind. The installation would be freestanding and not require any wiring. The images could be printed locally on, on paper or on an acetate using imagery supplied by local artists, some of whom could be students, and they could be changed out monthly or bi-monthly. The Board of Commissioners expressed an interest in doing a holiday-themed display of vintage cards and arts around the bayou, and this would allow us not only to use those images, but to create an illuminated walkway around the bio, bayou doing so. This is perhaps our greatest leap into the future. 
Using holographic techniques, an array of projectors mounted on building roofs, a lifelike display of fish, animals, historic figures like a sponge diver, a sponge hooker, cracker or tarpon, grouper, octopus, Greek dancers, fireworks, Christmas, Santas, and other moving three-dimensional images could be projected over the Anclote or the bayous to create amazing shows unlike anything that exists outside of Disney. The technology was used by the Roncalli Circus in Germany to present the feel of a traditional circus without the actual use of animals. The results are stunning and the resultant shows would attract tourists to Tarpon to see a unique display unlike any, in, any other in the county, the state, or the southeastern United States. The technology is provided by a company in California and is not prohibitively expensive. Changing the displays is much like changing a vinyl record. This would be an innovative and unique marriage of art and technology. The Tarpon Springs Public Art Commission Committee wishes to thank the Board of Commissioners <coughs> and city staff for continued support and encouragement. We are excited as we begin this new phase of contributing art to enhance the city's visual experience and sense of place. Thank you very much. Thank you, and I want to thank you for uh, the report, but also I want to thank you for your service to uh, our committee. But uh, with us today, we also have the Public Art Committee members, and I want to thank you all for being here, and I want to thank you for the work that you do for the city of Tarpa Springs. I'd like to, uh, Mayor, if I may, I'd like, like to especially uh, thank our advisor, Diane Wood, and our city liaison, Denise Manning. They've been crucial to our efforts. Thank you. If you please stand up to be recognized, all of you. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Commission comments? Yes, uh, yes, thank you, uh, Joan, and thank, thank you all. I've attended some of your meetings, and you've accomplished a lot this year, and, and especially this year. So we, we're moving forward, and I, I really appreciate all your hard work. Um, on some of these things that you mentioned uh, that you're looking forward to, um, murals is something that we've talked about on the docks as well. We do have some nice murals on the docks, and when you're thinking about where you're going to put them, uh, please consider you know, thinking of where, and I'm sure there's some building owners that would not mind having murals on, on their properties as well. So Right. We, we <laughs> did have a um, model draft contract prepared so that when we go to building owners, we can have talking points to explain to them exactly what's involved with putting a public art committee mural on their wall. Okay. So. Thanks. Uh, the Gobi fish idea, I've seen it, you know, before. <laughs> seen the images and, uh, from other areas. I think that's a great idea. Um, hopefully it'll help with the, uh, the plastics and straws and things that uh, shouldn't be on the beach. Uh, I love the solar powered boxes. I hope that we can include those on the docks as well. Um, mm -hmm. and, um, and then the, um, the, uh, the circus thing. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's really out there. I mean, you know, it's, know it, it, it's it would be. <laughs> But, it, it, know, that would be a, that would be a stretch, but yeah. you know it would be fa fantastic if we could pull it off because it would su be such an amazing tourist attraction. Even for you know for the, the holidays, uh, right? The holidays something. alone would be fabulous to have Santa in his sleigh and you know all kinds of different yeah. you know Christmas decor on the you know either on the enclosed or on the bayous. Yeah, or on the sponge docks, you know, in the river. Where right, the we could have yeah, we could have sponge divers emerging from the river. We could have tarpon leaping, and yeah, yeah. and you, you change the images like you would change a vinyl record. Right. So it's, pretty it's, easy it's once you get the uh, the original. Right. Uh, so again, just thank you guys, and I'll try to keep coming to some of the, your meetings and appreciate all your all your hard work. Thank you. Thanks, Diane. I mean, Thanks, Mayor. Uh, Joan, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I, I know I may come across critical at times uh, on some of the things that I'm passionate about, and obviously public art is one of them. Uh, I do want to say I think you all have done a great job putting together some ideas. I'm really impressed on some of the ideas that you've come forward with. Uh, I just want to touch on a few of them. Uh, the historic mural, I think it's an important one to have uh, around Tarpon. That was obviously one that was in Tarpon Springs already. Uh, and then, for some reason, the, the business owner wanted to cover it up for some dispute between the city. I'm not really sure what it was many years ago. 
Uh, also, I know um, there's some discussions about some other large murals in downtown or just south of downtown as well. Uh, a couple other items. One of the items that um, I was talking to one of the members about was the scholarships uh, that we could provide to the local St. Pete College Tarpon campus or the um, Tarpon Springs High School students. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I like how you all ran with this one. Um, my initial thought was is that we utilize a scholarship in a, in a type of competition. Uh, instead of just giving a scholarship just because of the, what they've done in the past, that we give someone an opportunity with the trash receptacles that we have at our public parks, uh, similar to the golf course, Little League Field, Sunset Beach, um, Splash Park, and I'm, I'm sure I'm missing a couple more. Uh, but we have a competition to where they could create a design that they could put on that. And then the winners of the five winners or whatever it may be would win the $500, $750, whatever it may be, scholarship that they could use for school or whatever they want to use it for um, for the project. So that was kind of my thought behind the scholarship. I think there would be an opportunity to do a competition instead of just giving a scholarship out based on maybe what they've done historically. Uh, it really gives also um, the students an opportunity to put some public art out in the public and it gets their foot in the door to maybe start doing some other larger projects in other cities as well too. So I would potentially, I would like to make the suggestion that you look that avenue with the, um, the scholarship, but I think mm -hmm. you all did a great job drafting it. It looked great overall, but I think there's, uh, you could do some type of a competition with it. Um, the maintenance is obviously an important aspect of it, of the public art. Um, let's see, the artist alley, I thought it was a great idea. Uh, you really can't, you got creative with that one, the interactive art. Uh, Commissioner Seaver mentioned something about the interactive art uh, and the murals down on the sponge docks. I think it's an, another important part. We have a lot of tourists in the sponge docks. So if we could somehow do uh, a couple interactive murals down there as well. And also at Sunset Beach by the bathrooms, I think is another good spot for an mm -hmm. interactive mural. Uh, I know this is just a start uh, and you're heading in the right direction. I think it is, I mean, it sounds incredible. Um, I hope the business owners are in favor of that um, alleyway. I'm not sure if you've talked to them yet or not about that, uh, but it is a really great idea. And also these solar paneled illuminated, um, illuminated boxes. So when I think of the sponge docks, um, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of tourist action during the day, right? And, and after the sun goes down, you have the restaurants, but that's about it. After the sun goes down, the beautiful sunset over the river, uh, there's not a whole lot to attract people to the sponge docks. Uh, we have some restaurant activity, but I think this illuminated solar power um, or holograms over the uh, Anklote River and Spring Bayous or wherever, may, wherever they may go, I think this, the Anklote River is a, the best idea for the sponge docks because we want to be able to keep somehow, how do you attract people to stay in Tarpon Springs for the night also? Mm -hmm. They come in during the day, they have lunch, and then they're gone. Maybe they would stay around for the, the light show. It could be changed monthly. Or maybe it's just done once a week on a Friday or Saturday. Uh, I'm not really sure what day it would be. And then um, each month it changes based on the season or whatever it may be. You exactly. incorporate history. So I think you're on to something great here. And it, it's really, it's a cutting edge technology, it sounds like, that you're looking at. And it, it really fits our town that we could look at the history aspect. Right. We, we really wanted to try to do something that was uh, unique and but that also said tarpon you know we want to preserve the you know the culture the images of tarpon you know the sponge docks i thought it was interesting that andreas talked about lighting on the sponge docks and we were considering doing these illuminated light boxes so it kind of also ties in somewhat with you know some of the interest that the merchants had you know in uh, you know lighting up the sponge docks yeah, and illuminated solar boxes, again, another great idea. You're, you're using uh, technology and art together. Uh, I think it's a, a wonderful thing. Uh, you guys have, you all have done, uh, women and men have done a great job. So I just want to really say thank you for coming back with some great ideas. Um, now, the art container, I'm not a huge fan of having an open art container. I've seen this picture kind of rotate on Facebook. It's not my favorite item to see the mesh and all the plastic mm -hmm. uh, I, I prefer to see something smaller that's covered up and contained uh, I think it just looks, looks cleaner overall and we have a small beach in that area so um, I wouldn't necessarily support something along those lines with the um, open mesh concept but if it's more of a closed container I would be happy to support that um, I'm not sure what would be made out of potentially aluminum of some sort that they could still dump it into a um, right. a larger truck or something along those lines. Well, as I mentioned, we would have to consult with Mark and Public Works because it has to be something that's easily disposed. So that's why the mesh would make it light, 
and and the, the whole idea is to get people, especially children, to feed feed the creature, whatever it is. And uh, you know, but I, I understand what what you're saying about keeping it, you know. Yeah, I think we can come up, up with a, a good compromise overall so where I can support this project, um, but I would prefer it to be closed um, instead of just open air. Mm -hmm. uh, overall, like, like I said, I really um, want to really, really uh, congratulate you all for this because I'm really super excited about this moving forward over this next year. I think we're going to see a lot of great public art. Mm -hmm. We still have some funds available as well for the next year to also do some projects. So, again, thank you very much for your hard work. You're welcome. Thank you, Mr. Garvin. Yeah, again, to kind of echo what the other commissioners have said, you guys took our direction so well. You guys do a fantastic job of beautifying the city. Um, I really love the artist alleys, um, love the big murals that were getting proposed, and I, I really, really like the scholarship. Um, anything we can do to get more involved with all our local educational institutions, whether it is the college, the high school, the middle school, wherever, um, I think that's always a plus. Uh, I did have some questions. Um, I just wanted to know how the artists uh, charge for these murals because I was looking at the numbers for the budget and I know um, some artists do like per square foot when they're creating a mural but do we let the artists bid when we're throwing out a mural opportunity or do we set the budget and then we do the press release kind of? Well uh, the idea behind the artist alley would be sort of using uh, more, you know, artists more on the lines of students. There are, there are already a number of people who are doing murals free of charge in town. Mm -hmm. So this would almost be uh, an honorarium of some sort. And, you know, just like any other art or profession, the more qualified somebody is, the price goes, goes up. Yeah. So if we get some students who just want to literally make their mark, you know, on, on, on the town, then, you know, we would be offering them a flat honorarium price you know, for, mm -hmm. for the mural and let them be creative. Uh, of course, we'd, we would have to get, a, you know, approval for the, top, you know, the subject matter. Yeah. But, uh, you know, when you get into some, something like, you know, a named artist who is doing a mural, then the game changes. Yeah. So, uh, you know, the artist alley would really be to encourage, you know, uh, unknown artists, you know, something almost on the line of a graffiti artist and to create a fun atmosphere. And I know, so, you know, at the workshop that you had on, uh, at the end of May, I know there was a lot of talk about doing selfie opportunities and that would be the perfect opportunity to have somehow incorporate Tarpon Springs so that when people take a, a shot in front of the mural, everybody would know that they were in Tarpon Springs. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then on the holograms, when I first saw the pictures proposing mm -hmm. the holograms, I said there's no way that they can look this good. So I actually Googled the Roncalli Circus and I, I watched. Aren't they amazing? Yeah, it's, it was incredible. Um, I was just wondering if doing it outdoors, like over the river or in a bayou, would that diminish the effect of it? Or would that, you know, harm the equipment if we did it over time? Uh, I just uh, the thing the is, they have been done outside. Uh, I have done some research into the company. I'm planning to do some more. And uh, the quality is there. Um, the circus itself uses uh, 24 projectors because it's 360 degrees. Mm -hmm. So if you could just, if you just wanted to protect 100, project 180 degrees from people, you know, say on the sponge docks or in Craig Park looking out you know, onto the uh, hologram projected over the bio, you'd need half of them. But the, the quality is amazing, and the technology is there, and it's even, it's not even that expensive. Yeah, absolutely. I just, and then my, my last thing regarding the holograms is that I would just be careful to respect the history of the area. That's why I would, I would favor it, you know, to keep people in the sponge docks at night. I think that'd be fantastic. We could select, you know, certain places around the bayou or even at one of our beaches, I guess, if we could get the projectors out there. But mm -hmm. just to, to be cautious, because, you know, the Epiphany area, the bayou, I don't think anybody would want, you know, a hologram circus over such a sacred spot, so. No, I was thinking more about, you know, where the mermaid is, mm -hmm. you know, at that juncture, you know, or maybe going over uh, even into Whitcomb. Yeah. You know, and, um, you know, I, I think one of the biggest things would be to have, uh, you know, a holiday or, you know, Christmas themed mm -hmm. projection because I think the kids would just love it. Yeah. It would be a real family event. Yeah. 
I, and then I to do open, and to do history and cultural, you know, imagery mm -hmm. also would be just great. Yeah, I'd be open to any of those. I just want to be mindful of that. But that's all I got for you. And thank you guys again. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Jennings, looks like all my questions were covered, but I have a couple things that I'd like to ask you. You mentioned something about the pricing of the mules. How do you, do, how do you gauge if it's the right price or not? Well, uh, as I said, for a do you that you follow or? Yeah, the, um, you know, the, the big one that we had was the uh, historic mural, and that was priced at $50,000, which is a significant amount of money. Yeah. And I was given backup in you know materials, which I didn't include for the in the interest of time, uh, you know about uh, appraisals and value and artist credentials that, you know, supported not only that price but something even higher. So that was how that one was determined. The other the other murals again it would be a sliding scale again depending on the complexity of the mural, the qualifications of the artists. And then going back to the uh, you know the artist alley, they would be, you know maybe fifteen, seventeen, fifty each. And Jules just reminded me we were also thinking about incorporating a solar lighting component back in the alley to, uh, you know, to kind of play on what Commissioner Carr did on hibiscus, but but using you know some kind of solar spotlights on the alleyway. I like the fact that you're going to be using holographics and using technology. I think it's neat. Uh, move us, it takes us to, uh, to another level. Mm -hmm. And uh, plus you change in those pictures as, you, as often as you want to. For the record, I'd like to uh, comment that uh, for the 2020, the budget is 172000 which I think is uh, very aggressive. Mm -hmm. And that's going to leave us with $122,600 for remaining on the budget for, uh, for, the, for next year so mm -hmm. more projects to come so I think it's very aggressive and uh, I'm looking forward to seeing them complete it. Well I think in most budgets and negotiations I think we went high so that if we come in low we look good <laughs> so but if we go over then we look bad so I think we want to look good so I think we're going to try to be as frugal as possible when we, uh, you know, put these uh, things out for bid and actually uh, contract people to do them. Well, thank you. We are now going to the uh, public comments. Do we have any public comments on this item? Thank you, Mayor, Commissioners. My name is Costa Vati Kiotis. I live at 538 West Cedar Street, Tarpon Springs. Um, I've sat in on a couple of meetings with the Public Arts Committee, and you've got a, an excellent group of people that are enthusiastic and creative. And as you can tell from the asterisk items um, on their art projects that they've got planned, they really value your guidance, and I would hope that that would continue in the future. I think that's paid off. Uh, the workshop helped quite a bit to focus the Public Arts Committee, and, and um, I think that continued support would be uh, very helpful. Um, the one thing that I also wanted to mention that I didn't see that I would hope that we would continue was the, uh, the artistic uh, sponge docks gateway that was discussed. I know there was really not any conclusion on the approach to, to, to take on that. I think... Um, that was discussed about taking an off-the-shelf uh, idea, but I think the consensus was to move forward with something more artistic. And even though that item may not come out of the Public Arts Committee budget, I would hope that you would utilize the public arts process, since they're very skilled and adept at working with artists, to develop the concept for the sponge docks uh, uh, gateway. I do know that there was some uh, discussion as well of uh, consulting with uh, Mr. Chris Dill, a very well-known artist here in Tarpon Springs. I think maybe his availability might be an issue, but the reason I'm bringing these things up is I think you had a very good workshop, um, and I would like to see a couple of those important things that weren't mentioned this evening continue, and that we don't lose track of that either. Um, as I said, 
the Public Arts Committee are very enthusiastic and creative, and I wouldn't cut them short even with putting, giving them the responsibility of doing a sponge docks uh, entryway. Um, thank you. Thank you. Any other public comments on this item? Any other public comments on this item? Hear none. You want to comment? Yeah, I just want to comment on what Mr. Babicu said. Okay. Okay. Uh, that you mentioned the entryway sign to the sponge docks or the some artistic entryway. I did talk to uh, Christopher Still. He's going to be going to Greece for for a month, but he said he would be willing to do some consultation on some type of artwork uh, based on what we're looking for. And I think you know one of the discussions we had before we start this is where we're going to put it because of us you know maybe looking at city property instead of the, the property that's zoned right now uh, by the group that owned the Papas building. So I don't know yeah. if you want to say anything more to that, Mark, but. That was our next step, I think, was to look yes, at Yes, and we're looking we're at that and trying it. to give different options, uh, hopefully both options, closer to the corner and and an alternate option. So we're looking at all options available. And then it's just going to be how big the base is going to be. That's going to – that'll be the question of what area we have. But we're working on that right now. Okay. It'd be great to, like, move on with that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Any other public comments on this item? You know, Thank you. Thank you. We are now going to the uh, consent agenda. The item number five is the minutes. A, May 21st, 2019, work session. Six, the satisfaction and release of liens. Number seven is the attorney fees. Trask, A, Trask and Dynog. Invoice, June 2019, and B is Johnson and Jackson. Uh, uh, Jackson. The invoice, 4537, 4538, and 4539. Number nine is the special events. A is the Hippie Fest, August 10, 2019. Number nine is the award file number 190069-C-CM, Tires and Related Services, utilized in the Florida Sheriff's Association bid number 19-TRS21.0. Number 10 is the award file number 190119-BJJ, the Deaconese Boulevard. Title Flooding Improvements. And number nine is Renew File Number 180023-C-RS, Fire Equipment Parts Supplies and Services. And number 12 is the Increase File, RFQ Number 1601-32-SJJ, City Engineer of Record. Number 13, a is to reject all bids for bid number 190072-B-CM, paving and micro uh, reserve uh, facing. And, number, and B is the award file number 190097-CCM, pavement and roadway infrastructure rehabilitation utilizing city of uh, Largo bid number 17-C589. Number 14 is select George F. Young Incorporated for RFQ number 190091, SJJ Survey Services, Continuing Services. And number 15 is the award bid number 190102, BJJ, Reverse Osmosis Water Facility Generator Distribution Upgrades. And I'd like to pull number 10. Do you like to pull any other item? Yes. Which one? Uh, 12, 14, 15, and then I have a comment on 13. 12? 12, 14, and 15. Okay. Anything else? Yes, I'd like to uh, have some comments on uh, and questions on 10 and 13. Yeah, I'm going to pull that one. 10, 13. 10, 13. Yeah, I also had a comment on 12, but we're pulling it. Number 12, yeah. Any uh, comments on the uh, item number 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 11? No. 
Any public comments on this item? Hear not. Chair will entertain a motion. Motion to approve those items. Second. And roll call, please. Commissioner Donovan? Yes. Commissioner Carr? Yes. Commissioner Sieber? Yes. Mayor Alahusis? Yes, thank you. Number 10. If you want, I'll bring Rob Barbersnap. He can do all of them but one. Um, you're going to do the pay? Oh, wait, let's bring Bob. Sit. <laughs> Wrong order. Since he's number 10 and he's got all the other ones but the one Tom Function's bringing up, I'll leave you up there to take all the ones except 13. Right? Okay. That'll work. Those are all yours, right? Sure. Okay. Item number 10, this is an item that I've been waiting for a long, long time. Stormwater project to improve flooding on the, on the, the Deaconess Boulevard related to the uh, seawater rise. Uh, Mr. Function and Bob, we've been talking about this for, uh, for, many, uh, for many months, I will say several years now, that um, we are now going to install three check valves to reduce the impact of the street flooding on uh, the Deaconess Boulevard. Can you please tell us the locations, where you're going to place them, and how, if you just can describe what's going to happen. Yes, sir. So uh, thank you. I'm Bob Robertson, Project Administration Department Director. And uh, the project you're talking about is the installation of three check valves on the sponge docks on Dodecanese. Uh, the locations are Athens. Uh, the, the, there are three stormwater outfalls that float from the south to the north to the river. And those, um, those outfalls are at Athens, Hope, and Arferis. And the installation of these check valves essentially prevents tidal, high tide flow, backflow up into the streets. Um, this is what we call the sunny day flooding. Uh, this don't, doesn't happen too much, but it can exacerbate effects when we have uh, heavy rainfall. So this is a first step in a multi-phase approach to, to deal with the flooding on the sponge docks. We're very excited to get this one going especially since it came in um, under our budget. Thank you. The, um, the storm pipes from the street to the river, are those going to be replaced and increase the diameter? That'll be the second phase. Um, that's a major uh, infrastructure improvement that'll be required, but for now we're gonna start with the check valves, but you're absolutely right. The upgrading of the inlets and the conveyance system, the storm pipes that get the water in that drainage basin to the river are gonna need to be upgraded too as a future phase. Thank you, Bob. And just recently, we installed two more check valves in the different locations. Can you share that with us? Yeah, you're talking about the check valves project. at, I'm sorry to interrupt you, Mayor, go ahead. That's fine. Okay, <laughs> the, uh, you're talking about the installation at uh, Bayshore, Bayshore and Sunset, and, uh, yeah. and I think the other one is the one, oh. excuse me? The canal. Right, um, I think Tom can talk to you about the how those are operating, but I, I know this were um, at least the Bayshore and Sunset was done in house. Did we do the one at the canal or was yeah, that a Tom, county? Tom, come on, no, I forgot yeah. to involved in Yeah, let me get a little help on that one. <laughs> Tag team. They pulled most of Bob's items. So. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, Tom Function, Public Works Director. Yeah, we installed the first one in house uh, on Bayshore and Sunset, and that's how we got the uh, work with the engineer, and that's how we ended up doing the design to put these out to bid. Uh, we also put the one in at the canal and river and, and uh, North Riverside, or North Spring, whichever you want to call it. Uh, we put that one in house too, uh, using the, our, our own personnel. These ones have to be bid out because it's a little more involved. How they work? They're working okay. Uh, so far, so good. Yes, yes, okay. uh, very well. We're very pleased. Very pleased. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Dave. Will we should come. Will we should Yes. Uh, I'm oh, glad no to see this brought forward. I'm sorry that Andy has gone because this is something we've been discussing uh, for a long time and, and the merchants, uh, I, I'm a merchant on the docks, so obviously it affects me as well. So um, I'm very pleased that we, uh, we're moving forward with this. I saw that, uh, that this will be completed in 60 days. Uh, when will we proceed? When will it start? Do we have a start date? Well, as soon as we get your approval, um, we'll get the contracts. I believe this is, no, you're, you're authorizing the, the bid, so we'll have to, I think we have to come back with the contract for signature. You don't have the contract in your signature page tonight, do you? I don't think so. Okay, so with, with your approval, they'll get the contract finalized. Um, yeah. It'll be signed by your, uh, your, uh, the mayor and the city attorney, 
and well, we'll have the kickoff meeting, get the project started. I'm hoping we can get it done before season. Okay. That's that's the plan. <laughs> Hopefully. That's. I mean, we're, we're trying to move it as fast as we can. Yeah. So maybe by the end of the summer. I hope so. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any public comments on this item? Thank you, Mayor Commissioners. Coast of Addy Cotis, 538 West Cedar Street. I'm very, very happy to see that this is done. Uh, this is being done, and, uh, and thank you, Mayor Commissioners, for doing that. Um, I didn't have a chance to look at the uh, design or anything. I do have extensive experience with the sponge docks areas, and uh, barnacles and oysters are very, uh, that growth is very uh, aggressive down there, and I would hope uh, and maybe Bob can answer this, and I'm sure it's been covered that these are serviceable just in case of any kind of fouling with barnacles or oysters. Um, I think the initial operation is always great, but it's long term that w is what makes them pay for themselves. Um, and um, um, I'm not sure at what elevation that these are going to be placed, whether they'll only see. Um, water at flood tides or whether they'll actually be um, submerged um, in a tidal area where they'll be routinely a wash of salt water that would make a tremendous difference thank you mayor thank you are there any public comments you are none uh i need a motion motion approved uh item number 10. i just had a question i saw bob shaking his head on barnacles and where the and I was just wondering whether he could expand uh, on that we get before we make a motion. We okay, now. second. Okay. Okay, yeah, so to address that issue, we specifically had the uh, engineer look at installing them just downstream of, of a stormwater um, catch basin of an inlet box so that we could pull the grate and jet them clean. Um, it's a little more expensive for actually for us to do it that way. The alternative would have been to put it at the end of pipe where you get a lot more of the barnacle growth but it makes them harder to maintain. Right. So we opted for the solution so we could maintain them on a regular basis. Thanks. Thank you. All right. Yep. Roll call, please. Commissioner Donovan? Yes. Commissioner Carr? Yes. Commissioner Sieber? Yes. Mayor Alhusis? Yes, thank you. Next item is number 10. Increase RFQ number 160132, SJJ, City Engineer on Record. Thanks. Commissioner Carr? We just uh, just cleared, I think it's, it's 12. I'm 12. You read it correctly. Um, thank you, Mayor. Bob, if you can just, uh, I had some questions on, on this one a couple years ago when I was first elected. Uh, obviously, this is a significant amount of money that we're spending on engineering services. I just want um you to elaborate a little bit further on there um my question in the past was if we're spending this much on engineering services why don't we just hire an engineering department in our own city and have them staffed and we could fluctuate staffs up and down depending on the workloads uh so can you just touch on this a little bit for me so i have a better understanding sure i'd be happy to so uh, the summary of the item just real quick for for the for the camera for the audience is that we're asking for an increase to our existing engineer record contract that allows us to use engineering services on a continuing basis. Um, we, have a we have two contracts under this authorization uh, with two engineering firms. So it's a five-year term um, with annual uh, upper limits that the board establishes for us as staff to use. Um, the current upper limit is 500,000 a year and we're asking for an increase of 200,000 to bring that to 700,000 to use with those two engineering firms. So we're two and a half years into the, the current five-year authorization. And over that two and a half years, we've used just over a million dollars worth of engineering services. Um, to put that in perspective, that's, that's, a, that's about 400 and it works out to about $426,000 per year in engineering services. Now, if you compare that to, if we were to hire engineering staff and create our own engineering um, department, um, you'd probably be able, be able to get four, maybe five um, engineers, uh, entry level, varying level de degrees, um, including benefits and everything for, for that amount of money per year. Over the last two and a half years, the, we've done about 27 projects or authorizations with our engineer record contract. And I went back and double checked it. Um, the team that we were able to tap into was 
uh, 42 engineers, ecologists, architects, surveyors, admin staff, specialists um, that worked on our specific projects. That's not just the number of people that work for those firms. What I'm getting at is um, we were able to get, for the price of five engineers, 42, a staff of 42 to work with. Um, I think that's a, a pretty good bargain if, if we're thinking about how much work that we are trying to do. Um, this gives us access to expertise that we simply couldn't replicate with in-house staff. So, I hope that summarizes it for you. Yeah, it does, uh, and thank you. These, and help me understand too, an engineer, engineers specialize in certain trades or certain parts of engineering. Certainly. Like the same engineer might not do stormwater, but might not do the turn basin, or may not do sign design. Am I Absolutely. right to that? Yes, okay. that's correct. So that's one thing we could, the city's able to do when they outsource it, is they're able to go and these specialties in and have someone that specializes in engineering. That's exactly okay. right. Uh, when I look at the backup too, it looks like a, a significant amount of spend is for the Mango Mirrors and Boulevard improvements, um, the Ancloat River turn basin uh, design and permitting. So those, that's a significant amount of that big chunk of change that we're talking about tonight, um, or significant amount of dollars that are being spent. So, um, I, although it's hard for me to still understand that why don't we have more engineers on staff, I think this is a, a good move um, because of the ebbs and flows in the market. And I don't want to hold back any of the projects that we're really on the cusp of completing and getting uh, started. So uh, I would support this one tonight. Thank you. Commissioner Donovan? Yeah, thank you again. And I just wanted to put it in more layman's terms because I, I confirmed this when, with you when I first saw this was that um, it's not like, you know, they're just increasing their price or anything like that because this is a lot of money even for um, for consultants with so many staff members. I just wanted to confirm that we were doing more projects with them and that's why the price is increasing. It's not an, um, an expensive issue. It, it's, it's more just we're actually doing and moving forward with more of our projects at the moment. That's exactly right. We're doing more work. Okay. Thank you. Any other comments? Are there any public comments or this item number 12? Okay, none. Rook, uh, I need a motion. Motion to approve item Second. 12. Second. Roll call, please. Commissioner Donovan? Yes. Commissioner Carr? Yes. Commissioner Sieber? Yes. Mayor Alahusis? Yes. Number 13, paving. Reject all bid for bid number 190072 BCM paving and micro uh, resurfacing. And B is the award file number 190097 CCM pavement and roadway infrastructure rehabilitation utilizing seat of Largo, bid number 17C589. Commissioner Sip. Yes. Um I know that we've been talking about this <laughs> for a while, right. um, especially the micro surf, uh, surfacing. Um, you know, there's nine locations that that, that need uh, work, yes. and and some of these, you know, we again, the residents have been complaining or concerned for a while. Mm -hmm. uh, can we do any micro surfacing uh, in house? Uh, no, it's kind of a specialty product, and the, the volume of asphalt here we could possibly handle in the house. Okay. Microservice is a little bit different than your regular one inch and a half surfacing <coughs> that we usually use. Uh, it's much more, it's cost effective, and it's only used on roads that have a good solid base onto it. Uh, once you start getting into ma major potholes and things like that, the, the preliminary work you have to do with microservicing then gets much more expensive. Yeah, I'm thinking of these alleys that. Uh, alleys will be regular pavement, uh, inch and a half pavement. So they will yes. be paved? Yes, they'll okay. be uh, right. inch and a half. Uh, S SB9, yes, ma'am. Okay, great. And so uh, you'll go back out to bid after uh, we approve this, or you, you come back with more bids, or when will we'll, well, the timeline well, th for Well, this contract we're going to pick, the pick contract for piggybacking off is this Largo contract, which ends the end of 2019, uh, October 1 of 2019. Uh, so we, uh, we can either, next time we come up with another uh, list, you can either rebid it or use a, a piggyback contract. The advantage about the piggyback contract is you're working with volume. Luckily, there's a lot more paving than we do, so that's why we got the lower prices off of them and going out for ourselves. So we would have to rebid before October? 
No. Uh, Unless we no. piggy bank? No, I have to. Uh, once I start this, one, start this project with that contract, we'll be able to finish this whole okay. this list. And any other ones we may, that may come up uh, in the meantime. But after October 1, we'd have to go back and either rebid a new paving contract or piggyback off another existing contract. Okay. I guess my point is that we, j we need to get it done so uh, yes, as soon as we can. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Tom, uh, were you rejecting this bid and we're saving how much, did you say? Uh, a little over $80,000. So I think it's worth it doing it. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. Any other comments? Yeah, thanks, Mayor. Uh, I just want to bring up a obviously it's come up com a couple times already with the other mayor and commissioners uh, about um, going out to big and then use it, utilizing a piggyback uh, there's been some discussion in the past uh, I'm encouraged that we just didn't go and use the piggyback uh, with another city I'm encouraged that we bid it out ourselves and this is a prime example to say the bids that we received back are higher than what another contract was so we evaluated the bids gave local businesses the opportunity to bid on it and then we realize that they're all higher than what we could go along and piggyback with the city of Largo. So I want to say thank you to the city manager and thank you, Tom, and the procurement team for, for doing that because I think it's an important aspect um, to do the whole evaluation that way. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any public comments on this item? If you're not, I need a motion for uh, item number 13, paving. Motion to approve. Second. And roll call. Commissioner Donovan? Yes. Commissioner Carr? Yes. Commissioner Sieber? Yes. Mayor Alhousis? Yes, thank you. Next item is number 14, select George Young, incorporated for the RFQ number 190091, survey services, continue services, Commissioner Carr. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Bob, just, uh, I know we talked about this also, but just want to put on the record. Uh, I believe this is $150,000 that you're asking for approval tonight. Um, now, can you just talk a little bit about um, in the past what the city has spent uh, for surveying or for surveying services and a little bit about what they actually do uh, for the city as well? Sure. Um, so this is another continuing services contract in the same vein as the engineer record contract that I previously discussed with you. Um, we have spent somewhere in the order of between thirty to sixty thousand in a year. This last year was was just about thirty thousand dollars. Um, the purpose is for us to provide, have for us as staff to have direct access to surveying services. Um, we would have the ability to sub that through our engineer record if we wanted to, but this cuts out the middleman and gives us direct access and um, lets us get survey work done for verifying boundaries, uh, topographic survey, su uh, subsurface utility engineering survey if we need it. Um, even marine uh, survey is in their, in their scope of work. So it's just another tool in our toolbox. Okay. Just because there's an upper limit of 150 doesn't mean that the city's planning on spending 150, right? That's correct. You're just establishing the upper limit for us. And, and any work that we do is is included in budgets for the, the different departments that you will go through and review during your budget process um, or parts of projects. Okay. Thank you. Are there any commission comments? Are there any public comments on this item? You're none. I need a motion. Motion approved. Second. A roll call. Commissioner Donovan? Yes. Commissioner Carr? Yes. Mayor Alahusis? Yes. Number 15 is the award, uh, bid number 190102 BJJ reverse osmosis water facility generated distribution upgrade. Commissioner Carr? Yeah, I just want to touch on this. Uh, I know I gave uh, props to the procurement department just recently, but uh, this is actually a little, a little bit different. I would like to ask city staff to look into this a little bit further. Uh, in the past, it looks like this was out to bid, no one bid on it, and then they reached out to um, uh, businesses to actually bid on this. And I think it's advantageous from the city's perspective is to not just put information out for bid. Again, I'm in procurement and I manage about $650 million a year in spend. Uh, I think it's important that you actually reach out to businesses that fall into uh, these categories, especially if we're going to spend a significant amount of money. So I would like to encourage our city manager to work with our procurement team on a way to reach out, especially to Pinellas County, uh, South Pasco, and especially Tarpon Springs companies. When we have these items come up for bid, uh, this one pertains to the, um, the generator distribution upgrades. Uh, and the circuit breaker uh, in that aspect. And I believe that's all electrical. Am I right in that, Bob? Yes, sir. Um, I 
Um, I do know I've, I've dealt with some, in, um, some uh, generator issues at my work currently uh, and getting some different companies in for bids. And um, although the, uh, I think the city managers let me know in the past that we, put, we post these for anyone to go and bid on, but it's not like everybody understands that these are out to bid. So I think, it's, I think it would really behoove the city to be proactive and to really advertise and ask the procurement team to call and reach out to some local uh, businesses to try to get some additional bids on these. Because the more bids we get, typically you're going to have a lower price. Uh, for example, this bid alone only had two people or two companies bid on it. Uh, I do think it should be a minimum also that we at least have three to four bids as well to move forward on an item. Thank you. Any commission comments? Are there any public comments on the item 15? Hear none. I need a motion on item 15. Motion to approve. Second. The roll call. Commissioner Donovan? Yes. Commissioner Carr? Yes. Commissioner Sieber? Yes. Mayor Tirapani? I'm sorry. Mayor Loses? Yes. Well, that concludes the uh, consent agenda. Now we go to. Uh, <laughs> special consent agenda, which is the item number 16, to authorize the settlement of lien for uh, 425 Way Favor Court for uh, Papa Thanasios. City Attorney, if you present this item. Yes, I'm bringing this to you. Um, this is a code enforcement lien settlement um, that has come up on the property located at 425 Wayfair Court. The property was cited 17 times over the past 20 years for different code violations. There were two outstanding code fines uh, from June of 2017 and October of 2017. The property owner passed away within the last couple of years. Subsequent to that, I received a phone call from the son of the owner of the property wanting to resolve the outstanding code enforcement liens. Um, over the last couple of months, I've been negotiating with the son, and I have um, before you tonight an offer of settlement of these two code enforcement liens for $7,700. The outstanding liens as of May 15th were $15,472.27. Um, I think that $7,700 settlement for these liens um, is, is a good settlement. Um, it prevents the city from having to litigate these issues and it also saves the city uh, the attorney's fees and court costs that we would um, incur as a direct result of bringing these foreclosure actions on this property. So I'm asking for your authority to accept $7,700 for these two code enforcement liens on 425 Wayfair Court, and I'd be happy to answer any questions for you. Are there any commission comments? Question? Are there any public comments on this item? The chair will retain the motion. Motion approved. Second. Roll call. Commissioner Donovan? Yes. Commissioner Carr? Yes. Commissioner Sieber? Yes. Mayor Luzes? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Item number 17 is a special event, full festival, staff report. This was just brought before you because this is a change in the special event. Uh, we talked about special events before. We told you that that happened. We bring them for you. So the Merchants Association is here tonight. Um, the change is, is moving from Orange Street to Tarpon Avenue. So the merchants are here. If you have any questions on them about the changes uh, in this event before you see it, that's the difference why this is on special consent as opposed to the consent agenda because of those changes. Any commission comments? Commission Carr. Thanks. Uh, is there someone I could speak to, please? From the Good evening. I'm Carol Rodriguez with the Tarpon Springs Merchants Association. Carol, thanks for coming up. Uh, you all do a lot of great events throughout the year, so I want to say thank you for promoting Tarpon Springs and the small businesses at Tarpon Springs as well. Um, I just want to clarify uh, a few items in the application. It talks about the event being from the 4th to the 5th. Um, and then if we go down to uh, closure of city parking lots, it talks about Orange Street parking lot will be closed from the 3rd to the 7th. Um, was that an error or is that correct? That's correct. We need to put up a tent on Thursday um, to house the band and tables and chairs. And okay. we've done that for the last four, four years. Okay. Um, and then something new, it looks like Mother Mears parking lot is going to be closed um, this well, year compared Mother to Mears, last year, right? Um, correct. 
Um, Mother Mears will be closed because on the 4th, it's our first Friday. And then um, on Saturday, we still won't be needing to use it. Okay. Has, um, at, I know there's some businesses downtown that complain about parking uh, on, on busy Saturdays and even throughout the week. Um, has there been discussions with the hair salons and some of the um, businesses that don't necessarily benefit from the large crowds and like the restaurants uh, in these situations? They have had the schedule since January. Um, on other events, they have called. Um, we do usually sometimes provide a shuttle service. There is parking. Um, it is going to be tough maybe for a couple of them, but the majority of the residents and people coming in from out of town to the event, I think, outweighs a little bit of inconvenience. They could maybe schedule their clients a little bit differently. Is there uh, any additional parking anywhere else, like um, out by 19 at all for this event? No, but I could look into it. Okay. It may be a good idea, uh, especially have, since Mother Mears is... Um, the Splash Park parking. Okay. And we advertise all the time about that. Okay. Yeah, I know in the past, Tarpon Tavern, or the Tarpon Tower has been used for, like, the craft show. It may be advantageous for um, the organization to look at that, if that's an option to help for alleviate. Because, obviously, when you take out the two main parking lots in downtown, it gets pretty tight pretty quick. Uh, so that would be my only concern. But uh, I've attended this event almost every year it's been here and it's a nice event to have in October um, so I'm excited about it so thank you for clarifying that for me you're welcome thank you are there any public comments on this item here none thank you for you're welcome there. thank you roll call oh, excuse motion. me I need a motion motion to approve second roll call Commissioner Donovan yes Commissioner Carr yes Commissioner Sieber? Yes. Mayor Hoosers? Yes. We are now going to the ordinance and resolutions. Item number 18 is the ordinance 2019 15 Firefighters Pension Trust Fund Amendment. This is a second reading. The city attorney will read the ordinance. This is ordinance 2019 15, an ordinance of the city of Turpin Springs, further amending the city of Turpin Springs Firefighters Pension Trust Fund, adopted pursuant to ordinance number 2000 18, as subsequently amended. Amending Section 1 Definitions by amending the definitions of credited services, uh, firefighter and spouse. Amending Section 2 Membership. Amending Section 4 Finances and Fund Management. Amending Section 8 Disability. Amending Section 15 Maximum Pension. Amending Section 17 Miscellaneous Provisions. Amending Section 25 Deferred Retirement Option Plan Drop. Adding Section 28 Supplemental Benefit Component for Special Benefits. Chapter 175 Share Accounts providing for codification, providing for severability of provisions, repealing all ordinances in conflict herewith and providing an effective date. That was the second final reading of ordinance 2019-15 by title only, and it was advertised um, on June 14, 2019. Thank you. This is the second reading. We got any new information on that? No, there are no changes. Thank you. Any commission comments? No. Are there any public comments on this item? Here none. Need a motion? Motion, motion to approve. approve. Second. Roll call, please. Commissioner Donovan? Yes. Commissioner Carr? Yes. Commissioner Sieber? Yes. Meryl Hoosis? Yes. Number 19 is a resolution 2019 16 fiscal year 2019 budget resolution. The city attorney will read the resolution. This is resolution 2019 16, a resolution of the Board of Commissioners of the City of Tarpon Springs, Florida. Amending the budget for fiscal year 2018-19. That was a reading of resolution 2019-16 by title only. Staff report, Mr. Lecours. Mr. Mr. Harris, Mr. Harris. Is ready. Uh, good evening, good evening, Mayor and Commissioners. A uh, budget resolution 2019-16 is being brought before you to budget for items that were not previously budgeted for in the fiscal year 2019 budget. Um, all items are listed in the cover letter. The major items are uh, capital projects in the penny fund, uh, some vacation sell, sell back funding that was done during the holidays, with the balance of the items being some operational items that have come up during the year. Uh, no general fund, unassigned fund balance is being used in the resolution, and if there's any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer them. Ron, thank you for everything you do. Uh, I have the question that I have is on the um uh, 
on the water plant electric uh, changes, is that including the connection to the sol solar panel panels that we're going to be getting? Uh, the, the solar panels are separate from that. This is, is just the additional electric that are having more demand being going through the pumps at the water plant, and it's causing them an increased demand on the electricity. But I know they got the solar project out there, and what they're hoping is a solar project will help reduce the cost of the electricity out there going through there. Okay. Okay. So that's not included into that? No. Okay. Thank you. I've got a couple questions. Uh, it could be for Mark or for Ron. Um, there's a couple of items. Extend Pinellas Trail Funding Penny Fund. I'm not familiar with that. Is that something we're going to be seeing, or did I just miss that in a meeting in the past? Well, that's, that's been on the uh, budget for the last couple of years, that project. This is the engineering work for the Extend Pinellas Trail. Okay. It's not the construction part of it. Okay, it's engineering work then. So yes. is that engineering work going through the city engineer, am I assuming? No, it's a consultant with that. Okay, so I'm, I guess that's approved previous yeah. before, before I got on, I'm yes. assuming. Okay. Um, additional maintenance to change out uh, lights to LED lights. Is that... Um, the street lights or those lights in-house in the uh, properties that we, the city owns? No, they've got, a, the, with Duke Energy, a project of going through all the street lights and changing them all to LED. And okay. so this is a cost for that. Uh, I would like to just make a comment on that. Uh, I do appreciate the brighter lights, but uh, I do feel like I'm at an airport most days or most nights when I come home with the white light compared to the softer um, lights that are currently throughout the city that are being currently replaced. Um, I know I've talked to Tom about that in the past, and he said the, the softer lights are more expensive. Um, but I know I've gotten comments from residents, and I would imagine other commissioners have as well, about these lights, that they're very sharp, they're very bright um, around the bayou areas, around the water areas. Uh, when you go out on your front porch, it's literally shining into your front yard and hitting your house. They're that bright. So uh, I would like the city to evaluate this, uh, city manager, if you could, and look at it, even if it costs a little bit more, I think it would be worth uh, looking at additional shields and uh, worth looking at a softer light than the bright white daylight uh, lights that are currently being installed um, across the city. Sure. Thank you. Mr. Cooper. Uh, yes, that's that's a good point. Uh, I was wondering what kind of lights we were going to be using, if they will be the softer LED. It's a great idea that, to change them all out to LED, but uh, those bright lights, and I don't know what what your estimate was on. Was it the softer lights or? Uh, that was just the estimate I got from Public Works on uh, what the cost of changing out the lights so far. Yeah, we, we may want to just see what type of lights those are. To try to go to the softer lights? Yes. Okay. Because uh, we do get concerned citizens who think that those other lights are too bright. Um, last year, we uh, budgeted some money for marketing, about thirty thousand dollars. Where did that money? Is that could that be included in here? Where did that money come from? Well, and that money is already in, in the original budget. We had the thirty-five thousand that was in the original budget. So that was budgeted for again. This yes. Year. Thanks. Yeah, I'd like to echo the concerns that citizens have had with the new lights uh, just being too bright. Some people, it's almost like being at like a football field, just kind of glaring right into the into their windows. Um, but also, I just wanted to know. I was curious for the welcome signs. I believe that's like 120,000. Um, where are those just going to go? Where our standard welcome signs are right now, like along the highway and stuff like that. Where are those welcome signs going? Um, those were the plans. That's when I got with Bob, the project uh, director, and they said I believe there was seven welcome signs that were being put out in strategic spots throughout the city. I guess mostly on Highway 19 and on Alternate 19, but I think it was like, like that's six that's or seven of them. Is that project that we're working on with FDOT to get the approval on? Okay, thank for you. all the entrance ways, and of course the entrance on Tarpon Avenue, the two bigger ones on Tarpon Avenue. Okay, yeah, I was just curious about that. And then do we know what caused the increase uh, at the water plant by $100,000, the electric use increase? Was there, like, an influx of residents using it, or um, do, do we have any kind of reason behind that? Or? Yeah, when getting with public services, they said there is quite the increase in demand going through the pumps at the water plant, which is causing the increase in electricity. And that's why we're bringing up before the, the mayor was the solar. So they're hoping that once they get the solar project going, that that'll help decrease that electricity flowing through those pumps. Okay, thank you. Uh, just to add that, we also increase the number of the wells as well.
Any other questions? Are there any uh, public comments on this item? Peter Protus, 901 Bayshore Drive. When Commissioner Terrapani had the program to put the lights around the bayou, and uh, we talked about them, uh, the city has seems to have forgotten, and the police also made a comment. We put the brighter lights because of the crime in the park. We put the brighter lights because of the crime and problems we had in the restrooms. We put the brighter lights to keep people from parking down there, walking around, and getting in trouble at night. That's why we have the bright lights. So we have to think about the safety in the bayou area and keep the bright lights because the softer lights didn't, didn't illuminate as much as the brighter ones. And I think if we look at the records of the crime, when we didn't have them and we got the lights and the bright lights, how much it's gone down, especially in the public uh, bathrooms and in the band shelter. So before you go to change them, you've got to think of the safety of the residents and the people who walk there at night and the people who live there, especially when we, the motel was there and we had all the drug activity there, we still have crime and that's why Mayor Alahoos's the bright lights were put in at that time. I remember that. And I would certainly go with the recommendation that the police department had about the lights for safety. Mayor. Thank you. Any other public comments on this item? Mayor, can I have a clarifying comment? Sure. Um, thank you for the public comment. I was referring to the actual street lights and not the, the lights within Craig Park. Okay. Thank you. The uh, chair will detain a motion. Motion to approve. Second. Roll call. Commissioner Donovan? Yes. Commissioner Carr? Yes. Commissioner Siebert? Yes. Mayor who's this? Yes. Item number 20 is the ordinance 2019-16, repeal taxi operator's permit. This is the first reading. City Attorney, if you please read the ordinance. This is ordinance 2019-16, an ordinance of the Board of Commissioners of the City of Tarpon Springs, Florida, Florida, repealing Division Three title taxi cabs of Article 5 of Chapter 11 of the Tarpon Springs Code of Ordinances and providing for an effective date of this ordinance. The second reading of this ordinance will be on July 23rd, 2019, and it will be published in the Tampa Bay Times by title only on July 5th, 2019. Thank you. I think this is necessary to do. We must uh, treat the uh, taxing companies the same as we do Uber and Lyft. So I think it's something we should do. Are there any uh, commission comments? Are there any public comments on this item? I hear none. The chair will obtain a motion. Motion to approve. Second. In roll call. Commissioner Donovan? Yes. Commissioner Carr? Yes. Commissioner Sieber? Yes. Mayor who's this? Yes, thank you. We are now going to uh, item number 2021. 20, is this the, the application 19 15 for 721 South Distant Avenue? Uh, this is the first reading. Item number 21A and 21B are related. We'll be discussed together, but we're going to vote separately. Item number 21B is quasi-judicial. Um, the 21A ordinance 2000, excuse me, the ordinance 2019-12, amend the future land use. The city attorney will uh, read the title and he will explain the quasi-judicial process. I'll read the quasi-judicial procedures first. This is a quasi-judicial proceeding where the Board of Commissioners acts in a quasi-judicial rather than a legislative capacity. At a quasi-judicial hearing, it is not the uh, board's function to make law, but rather to apply law that has already been established. In a quasi-judicial proceeding, the board is required by law to make findings of fact based upon the evidence presented at the hearing and apply those findings of fact to previously established criteria contained in the Code of Ordinances in order to make a legal decision regarding the application before it. The Board may only consider evidence at this hearing that the law considers competent, substantial, and relevant to the issues. Uh, if the competent, substantial, and re relevant evidence at the hearing demonstrates that the applicant has met the criteria established in the Code of Ordinance, then the Board is required by law to find in favor of the applicant. 
by the same token, if the uh, competent substantial ev relevant evidence at the hearing demonstrates the applicant has failed to meet the criteria established in the code, then the board is required by law to find against the applicant. I'll go ahead and swear in everyone that's going to speak on this issue, and then I'll go ahead and read the ordinances by title only. Anyone that's going to speak on these two agenda items, ordinance 2019-12, 2019-13, if you can stand up, raise your right hand, be sworn under oath. You swear that the testimony you're about to give is going to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Ordinance 2019-12, I'll read it by title only. An ordinance of the city of Tarpon Springs, Florida, amending the future land use map for approximately 0 0.33 acres of property located at 721 South Distant Avenue, lots 11 and 12, block 2, Toby, Toby's Acres, application 19-35 from ROG Residential Office General to RM Residential Medium, providing for findings and providing for an effective date. There will be a second reading of this ordinance after Pinellas County has completed its review. It was published in the Tampa Bay Times by title only on May 31st, 2019. Good evening, Mayor, Commissioners, Heather Erler and staff to this, uh, your planning director, staff to this uh, application. Um, this application is for um, Robert Reynolds. Um, again, it's for 721 South Distant Avenue. Um, as you can see on the, the maps attached, there's a small piece of property located on the corner of Distant and Mango. Um, that is, it's currently a residential office. Um, it, it's had a history as an office property and it was picked up when the, the maps were um, originally adopted. So it's been office for some time and your, your office category allows both residential and office uses. Essentially, the applicant is requesting this change um, in the future land use map and in the zoning um, map to allow for subdivision of the property. Um, so that he can establish a second residence on the property. There's currently a single family residence on there. Um, staff's concern is really with the basis for your um, comprehensive plan. Your comprehensive plan in this area doesn't really support um, the R60 uh, zoning district. It is a, a, a variety of different uses there. Um, they're a little bit more intense uses. And this is a transitioning area. This is the area, the corner actually, where the road is actually gonna get established when Mears is connected. So the land use are, the land use is one, is one issue, and that's being just amended to allow for that density at a smaller lot size to allow for the subdivision. Really the concern is the basis for the R60 and R70 um, zoning districts. They're meant to be neighborhood conservation districts. So those districts when they were established were established for a very unique reason, to recognize the existing neighborhoods and patterns that existed on the ground when the zoning code was originally established. So while theoretically um, he would need the zoning category in order to get the lot sizes, staff is not uh, supportive of this particular application for that reason because the intention of this district currently is for, the con is for recognizing existing neighborhoods. This is not an existing neighborhood. This is adding an additional lot. While there's residential, uh, single family residential in the area, and it's not a necessarily a compatibility, compatibility issue, it's really the construction of the code for that particular zoning district is really the concern that staff has here. And it doesn't meet the existing zoning pattern or the existing land use pattern that you've got out there. There's some issues and questions of what's gonna happen in that area as the roads get connected, the, what, what kind of transition you're gonna, is going to occur. And there's a variety of different uses in that area. So with that, that's the reason why staff um, is not supportive of this, this current change. There is an additional step in this particular process. Um, this is not just gonna be a local amendment. They would have to amend the countywide plan as well because it's on the countywide plan as office. So they're gonna have to go to the county for also approval uh, should this move forward tonight. The planning board saw this application and they actually had no concerns with it. They overturned um, the staff's recommendation and recommended approval. So uh, with that, I can answer any questions that you have, but the backup is pretty extensive on this application. Um, so if you have any questions, specific questions, I'd be glad to answer them. And the applicant, I believe, is present here tonight if you'd wish to speak. And now would be the opportunity for um, you to ask questions of staff if you have it. And if no questions of staff, then we'd have the applicant make a presentation if the applicant would like to do that. Any questions from the commission? I was, I was just speaking. 
Um, I understand that you're not in approval. Uh, what was the decision for planning and zoning to approve? I think pretty much unanimously. Well, planning and zoning doesn't really have a concern with residential in the area, but they're also not looking at the construction of your code. They're really looking at, well, what's the impact for the residential? And from a theoretical perspective, residential doesn't have, that's not where my concern is. My concern is really in the construction of your documentation and the intention of that section of code. So that's really what it is. Um, I just had one one other thing that I just wanted to add because there were two errors on the in the staff report. Um, one was on, and I just want to, make this correction on page seven it should say staff has received one email communication under the public correspondence section and then also um, just in the ordinance for uh, 2019-13 should this move forward under section two on the second page we would need to add a um, line there that would just say shall be rezoned to r60 one and two family which is what you're you would actually be doing under that ordinance. So I just want to make those two corrections. Commissioner Carr. Thanks, Mayor. Um, City Planner Heather. Um, so this is currently plotted, though, as two lots, correct? It Wait, is what? the underlying, they, they've been combined into a single lot, and under your code, once you're combined into a single lot, the underlying plat essentially goes away. So the platting is shown as, as two lots, but it's not two lots. It was combined into a single lot. Okay, but originally it was platted as two Correct. lots. Correct. And then the properties behind and next to it are similar sizes? Correct. Okay. Um, and then the RM is about a, a less than a, about a block away where there's current RM zoning or land use, correct? Correct. Okay. I don't have any, um, well, can you also help me understand then um, what the redevelopment of Mango Mears corridor area, um, what you're seeing or what your thoughts are from a staff perspective of redevelopment or some of those areas that you were talking about? So, so sure, you have two potential roads essentially that could potentially be connected. The first one is imminent for connection, which is that connection for Mears, the section um, between Mears and Mango that's actually gonna be connected as part of the Mears Town Center project. The other road coming into this area is distant itself has that hiatus. So there's potentially, if that road ever got connected, there could be a very different pattern here. Um, there is some open property in the area. Um, the city's landfill is in the area that uh, eventually could be developed with some other use than what's currently there. There's a lot of um, future options. Um, and with the development pressure for a roadway connection, when that usually happens, you usually see interest in changing. Um, the density patterns and the land use patterns in the area. And I would hate to put a residential, another residential unit there just to have them now impacted further by you know, some other request to change to multifamily in the area, that type of thing. And that's, that area is primed for that. You've got a, um, an older mobile home park that at some point may be redeveloped. There's a lot of potential for change there. Okay, thank you for clarifying. Any questions? Yeah, I just had a quick question regarding the size of it because I thought I understood it, um, but then when the the two the two lots uh, issue came up, it's 0.33 acres in total. That being Correct. a single lot, right? Correct. Okay, I just wanted to confirm that. Correct. Thank you. It was originally two, but then it was combined into one and developed as a single property. Okay. Is Mr. Reynolds here? Does Mr. Reynolds want to make a presentation to the commission? You want to make a presentation to the commission? No. Okay. Okay. So at, at this point then, you would open it up to the public mayor. Anyone wishing to speak from the public on this particular issue? All right, sir, if you want to come down here, I need to swear you in. If you could raise your right hand, be sworn under oath. You swear the testimony I'm about to give is gonna be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. If you could state your name and your address, please, and then make your presentation. Andre Miles, I live at 433 East Boyd Street, Tarpon Spring. They keep saying something about the intentions of the neighborhood. What does that mean? It's a neighborhood with a bunch of abandoned houses on it already. There's six houses on that street that nobody live in. And what I'm getting out of this is she gonna reject or they're gonna reject his request 
for what might happen 20 years from now, they keep bringing up this trailer park. That's down the street. And it's a dump across the street. Even if they connect these roads, what's that got to do with something that was already split at one time and somebody doing the same thing he doing to try to make it into a whatever you keep calling it a um, what is it? Um, it ain't residential now. What is it classified as? A um, residential office. Uh, office. Well, at at one point it was already residential, and somebody had to change the office, right? So I don't understand what the problem is that he's trying to put it back like it was. And their argument is it ain't keeping up with the intentions of the neighborhood. What does that mean? I'm trying to figure out they keep, what is the intentions of the neighborhood? It's already a residential neighborhood, so what is the intention that they keep bringing up these trailer parks and what might happen with the dump? Even if they build something there and those roads come together, you still gonna have the same neighborhood. So I just wanna know where they keep saying the intention that it ain't going with what they want. What is it that they want? It's already a neighborhood, there's houses there already. What are they gonna make the people that own the houses there now tear them down and suit what they want because a main highway is gonna come through there? Don't make no sense. He ain't trying to do nothing but put it back like it was. He ain't telling them to, or asking them to change their code or law or whatever it is they keep saying. Put it back like it was, that's all he asking. And I don't see the problem that's gonna be if he put another house there. If it was a two lots before, evidently there was a house there previous to it being an office space. There had to be a house there. Matter of fact, I know it was, because I lived there. That's all I wanna know. Thank you. Any other public comment? So, Mayor, uh, at this point, we can close the public hearing. And um, back to what? Back to you for consideration of this ordinance that has been read by title only. Thank you. I need to comment on that. Uh, on the page two, he has a spreadsheet on the surrounding zoning and existing users. Uh, if you look the uh, the zoning on the uh, north side of the uh, subject area, subject property, he shows that it's a residential urban. East of it is residential urban. South is also residential urban. West is an institution, recreation, open space, and single family residential. So to me, it makes more, it makes sense, and it's compatible already to what's there to uh, change it to the, uh, to the residential area instead of uh, keep it as the residential office. So I will support the application. Commissioner Donovan? Yeah, I would support the application as well. Um, I, I think just looking at a map of the area, I, I think it still fits. Um, again, if staff wants to come back and make any further comments on it, uh, they may, but I, I would support the application as well. Any other comments? Uh, I, I was just curious about the empty houses. Are, are they unoccupied uh, that he was talking about? Well, one of the houses I know for sure was related to the uh, to the sinkhole, not too far from there. Okay. So it's primarily residential then. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other questions? If not, Chair will detain a motion on the um, ordinance two thousand nineteen dash twelve, amending the uh, future land use map. For, for clarification, is this just uh, a? This is the 21A, yes. That's the ordinance 2019-12. Uh, I would move to make a motion to approve um, ordinance 19-35A uh, from residential office general to re residential medium. Okay, so we just need to clarify that. You're reading the application number as opposed to the ordinance number. It's ordinance 2019-12, which includes application 19-35. So you can just do a motion to approve ordinance 2019-12 and, and that would capture it. Okay, so I'm making a motion to approve ordinance 2019-12. Second. Roll call, please. Commissioner Donovan? Yes. 
Commissioner Carr? Yes. Commissioner Sieber? Yes. Mayor Alhuses? Yes. For the item number 21B, which is the ordinance 2019-13, amending the zoning map, this is the first reading. I need a motion for that. Let me go ahead and read that by title only. Uh, ordinance 2019-13, an ordinance of the City of Tarpon Springs, Florida, amending the official zoning map of the City of Tarpon Springs, Florida, for approximately 0 0.33 acres of property located at 721 South Distant Avenue, lots 11 and 12, block 2, Tubby's Acres, application 19-35 from RO Residential Office, to R60, one and two family residential district, providing for findings and providing for an effective date. That was reading of wardens 2019-13 by title only. There will be a second reading after Pinellas County Review. It has been advertised in the Tampa Bay Times on May 31st, 2019. Need a motion? <coughs> motion to approve ordinance 2019-13. Second. Roll call. Commissioner Donovan? Yes. Commissioner Carr? Yes. Commissioner Sieber? Yes. Mayor Alahuzis? Yes, thank you. Uh, tonight we have a long uh, agenda. We're going to take five minutes break. We'll be right back. Thank you.
Only at the office. Yeah. Yeah. We now reconvene the uh, BOC meeting at 8.37 p.m. We go to the item number 22. This is the ordinance 2019-14. The application 19-53 LDC tax amendment. Hotel Hyatt, this is the first reading. City Attorney, if you please read the ordinance. Mayor Commissioner's Ordinance 2019-14, an ordinance of the City of Tarpon Springs, Florida, amending Section 111.00 of Article 7 of Appendix A, the Comprehensive Zoning and Land Development Code by adding the ability to appeal an approval of a certificate of approval, providing for severability and providing for an effective date. That was the first reading of Ordinance 2019-14 by title only. There will be a second reading on July 9, 2019, it has been advertised on May 31st and will be advertised again on June 28th in the Tampa Bay Times. And staff report. Uh, good evening. Again, Heather Earl, our planning and zoning director and staff to this application. So this application um, came out of the necessity for um, the height criteria in the, uh, the highway business district is an issue for hotels specifically so we're looking to amend a very specific section of that ordinance for dealing with the height of the hotels in highway business and this is specifically based on um, the the building adjacent that's planning to be going in that you've um, requested us to uh, negotiate on your behalf a developer agreement with the existing um, development company that owns the Hampton Inn. This is adjacent to that. Um, essentially, they requested the variance. The variance failed. So as a result, our only option was to look at, you know, alternative for just hotels. And since Highway Business District is limited um, on the Alt-19 corridor, we're not so concerned because you're still going to control the height that ultimately happens on any hotel that's proposed so it's got to work within the the site diameter of the pro, the pri, the site perimeter that whatever property comes in in the case of this particular property on 19 that we're looking to uh, make this amendment to support it works very well there um, it may not work on some of the other locations and again that height limitation is controlled at the time of site planning so when you would see a site plan or if you would see a developer agreement those restrictions on what you want to see for the height can be put into those documents so staff's not really concerned and since we want to really promote getting another hotel or several hotels would be even better um, this is one of, of hopefully a couple that will come so that's really what the the genesis of this particular application is um, i can answer any questions you have but that's the the history of this particular application Heather, thank you. Um, the only question that I have, and then I'm, I'm going to comment, is we do have some buildings already that, um, like the uh, Tarpon Towers, is over 80 feet, correct? Correct. And the uh, there's a hotel right next to the subject property. That's correct. Which is the uh, Hampton Inn. That's over 55 feet, if I'm not mistaken. I don't think it's a little less than that, and that was subject to a variance. Okay. So... So this is something that we have done in the past, and uh, as you said, in order for us to have hotels there and to make sure that uh, it's uh, financially um, feasible, we have to make sure that uh, we give them the height in order for them to build a hotel. This is something we've been looking for a long time to have. This is an opportunity to do that, and I'm um, encouraging my uh, fellow commissioners to support it. Commissioner Carr. Thanks, Mayor. Uh, Heather, can you just clarify? I know there's a little bit of housing business on Pinellas Avenue, but there's not space to build a hotel in that lot. Am I understanding that correctly? Yeah, the the, the size of the lot is really what dictates um, the height of the hotel. So in the case of the one on 19, they're just constricted in, in, in size of that actual unit. There's not really any property that they can pick up. So in order for them to get to make it marketable and economically feasible, they've got to go up instead of going out. So potentially, if you were to receive an application on um, the Alt-19 corridor, likely they'd probably have to acquire property and do like land assembly and then change zoning to make something happen because most of the parcels that you have just aren't significant of enough size to even fit what the, the type of 
facility we're talking about okay. um, on 19. But it's have to be compatible to like the Ultra 19 four-door, correct? Well, yeah, it would. you don't have the same compatibility question, but you would control during the site planning process what you want to approve. So if you had concerns with the applicant that, you know, this is not the right place for this particular um, height or that type of thing, you would have the ability to control that during the site planning process because they come here for approval. Okay. There's no way really to get a hotel on any of the properties that we currently have without coming before you. Okay, so this is uh, primarily a highway business, US 19 four-door, correct? Correct, It's most of your highway business is on US 19. There's a few places on Alt 19 that have kind of crept in, but again, they're just, they're, the lots are just not right for where, the ho where a hotel would want to be anyway. They're kind of pushed out a little bit or they're below the southern part of the city kind of going towards Klosterman. and they're just in odd locations. Uh, yes, I, I approve this uh, application. I, I know where that uh, hotel is going, and and future uh, hotels or businesses uh, will have to come before us during uh, for their site plans. So I have no problem with this. Are there any public comments on this item? If you are none, the chair will obtain a motion. Motion to approve. Second. Roll call. Commissioner Donovan? Yes. Commissioner Carr? Yes. Commissioner Sieber? Yes. Mayor Lahousis? Yes. Next item is number 23. This is the ordinance 2019 17, the application 1956, vacation of the right away. This is the first reading. This is also a quasi judicial hearing. The same rules apply and procedures. I'm going to go ahead and read this ordinance by title only. Ordinance 2019-17, an ordinance of the City of Tarpon Springs, Florida, vacating and abandoning a portion of a 10-foot wide utility easement along the north property line of Lot 11 of the Hidden Ridge Townhomes Plat Book 129, page 71, providing for conditions, providing for findings, providing for proposed and future easements, providing for recordation in the public records of Pinellas County, and providing for an effective date. That was the first reading of this ordinance by title only. There will be a second reading on July 9th, um, and it will be published in the Tampa Bay Times on June 28th. Anyone that's wishing to speak on this item, if you could stand up, raise your right hand, and be sworn under oath. I swear that the testimony you're about to give is going to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Okay, okay. thank you. So st city staff will make a reservation. Again, Heather Earler, Planning and Zoning Director, and staff to this application. Um, this is an existing townhome that was built in 2007, and when it was built, it was built actually into the utility easement. So they're asking to essentially vacate this portion of the utility of the utility and drainage easement to allow for clear title for tra title transfer um, because they're planning on selling the property. It was discovered. A matter of fact, this has been sold more, more than once. This is not the first end user of this particular unit, so it was sold and conveyed prior to this with this uh, encumbrance. But the, a the applicant is currently asking for this vacate to basically just clear the title so that he can move move the property. Um, it meets all of the criteria. This is a plat vacation. It's a little different than a right-of-way vacation. It doesn't meet, meet the same uh, criteria. However, we met with um, the Public Works Department, and they don't have any concern that such a small portion of the, of the actual property. And the impact's already there because the structure is already there. So. Any water that what is going into that um, drainage utility easement is go currently going around the, the encroachment. Um, so we don't really have any concerns. Um, TRC approved this with, with no concerns, and um, the planning and zoning uh, the planning and zoning board does not see these applications. This is something that's specific to um, BOC. So. With that, we can answer any questions that you might have, but that's really what we're dealing with here is just a very small portion of an encroachment in an easement. We need to vacate that portion of the plat to allow the title transfer. Questions, sir? Heather, obviously the, uh, the applicant needs to have a, a clear title. The uh, contractor, developer who built this building, this, this property, this house, doesn't carry it, doesn't have any responsibility for doing that? <laughs> At this point, it was built in 2007. They have long since move, moved on. So um, at this point, this end user was not the original end user. So they're going to have a hard time tracking them down. Um, it, it's not something that the, the current owner 
really bears any responsibility for. It was it was allowed to happen in the past, and so as a result, it needs to be addressed. The building next door to that does it have the same issue? Do you know? Uh, the building next door to that, I, this is the only one that I'm aware of that was built into the easement, but again, without surveys, I, I couldn't tell you that. I can't answer that question. Okay. Any other questions? And now it'd be time for the applicant. Wait, wait, wait. Yeah, sorry. I just had a quick comment. Um, so back in 2007, was it just the developer was unaware of it and the city didn't, didn't stop them and the city kind of just let it fall through the cracks or? I can't really speak to it because this is prior to my time here. Um, there, I could find no history on what occurred as far as um, the, whether it was discovered or not. I think it was just not discovered. Um, so as a result, it is a small encroachment. We're talking about a foot, foot and a half. Um, so it's really very difficult. Um, but again, surveyors are, again, supposed to catch these at, at as built time. I'm not sure because I found nothing in the record that indicated there was any issue. Because okay. generally, this would have been done at that time, or some other corrective measure could have been taken. Okay. Yeah, the applicant is the applicant here. Applicant is here. Sir, if you want to step forward, you've already been sworn in. Do you want to make a presentation to the commission? Now is your opportunity. Thank you. Uh, my name is Doug Rupel. I live at 6080 80th Street North, St. Petersburg, Florida. I am the realtor of this deal with the seller. And he's, um, when we had this under contract and we were, it was just before, you know, shortly before closing is when this came up. And it was like the last thing on my mind since he's the third owner and it was built 12 years ago. Um, and when it came up um, there, there uh, he's, of course he's beside himself and uh, he, he just couldn't understand how this could have happened. And, but no, no survey was ever done prior to him and it was just never caught. I apparently it fell through the cracks or something back when this originally was um, put up, you know, uh, put forth. And the developer is out of business. So um, hopefully um, the, the new owner, um, it was a bank owned at one time and uh, because they had gone out of business or uh, uh, bankrupt and uh, but Again, he's, he's the third owner, and we've got a fourth, fourth owner now that's ready to, you know, move in. So, I've seen uh, the, the um, as far as the, uh, the drainage issue, it is very minor, it appears, uh, a foot or whatever it is. Um, and I, I don't, I can't see that there would be any drainage issue involved, and I contacted I contacted Duke Energy, City of Clearwater Gas System, WOW Internet, Frontier Internet, <laughs> somebody else. Um, actually, there are six total, and the City of uh, Tarpon Springs, and they all uh, agreed to it, at least on the on the uh, uh, letters that I presented to um, to Heather. Any questions of uh, this witness? Thank you, sir. Anyone else that want to speak on this uh, particular agenda item? Okay, we close the public portion. Now the ordinance is here for your consideration. Yeah. Are there any other commission comments? The chair will detain a motion. Motion to approve ordinance number 2019-17. Second. Roll call. Commissioner Donovan? Yes. Commissioner Carr? Yes. Commissioner Sieber? Yes. Merrill Hoosis? Yes. Thank you. Item number 24 is a resolution 2019-17, the application 1940, condition of use tourist home. And this is a quasi-judicial. The city attorney will read the, uh, the title and will explain the quasi-judicial process. This is resolution 2019-17, a resolution of the city of Turpin Springs, Florida, approving application number 19-40, requesting a conditional use permit to allow the operation of a seasonal short-term residential rental at 18 West Orange Street, located on the north side of Orange Street between North Pinellas Avenue and Grand Boulevard and the T5D district uh, of the special area plan, providing for findings, providing for conditions, and providing for an effective date. That was the reading of resolution 2019-17 by title only. And the quasi-judicial um, 
proce hearing procedures that I read earlier will apply. So now would be the opportunity for the city to make a presentation. Okay. Um, again, this application is uh, for conditional use. In this particular transect within the special area plan, in order to do a seasonal um, vacation rental, they have to come in and ask for this conditional use approval so that you can deem um, the project compatible or not compatible with the surrounding neighborhood. Um, staff feels that this is compatible. Um, again, they... it. These seasonal short-term rentals tend to function very similar to a single-family home. Um, it's just that they are rented on a more um, per often basis than a normal single-family home is under our code. So there really isn't any concern here um, that the intention, again, of your special area plan is to allow for a mixture of uses. Um, so this fits that criteria. Um, again, the project, the, the house is existing um, on the property. It, there's sufficient um, parking and access uh, for the property. It meets the criteria um, and conditions of the downtown character district that it's located in. Um, it's consistent with the goals, objectives, and policies of the comp plan. Um, there should be no um, adverse impacts uh, to the environment or historic resources since the home is existing. Um, and the conditional use should not affect uh, joining property owner because it, property owners because it should function and appear as a single family residential use. Um, again, there, there we have ability to serve it because we're currently serving it. Um, there's no expansion of utilities just because it's a single, because it's a seasonal rental. Um, with that, uh, staff recommends approval of resolution 2009-17 with the following uh, conditions. The property shall remain a single family residence rented as a single um, living unit. The building shall be maintained with the following, one smoke detector in each sleeping area, one smoke detector in the common hall between sleeping areas. Uh, smoke detector shall be of um, a 10 year lithium iron, uh, ion battery style. And uh, a fire extinguisher shall be provided and uh, shall have annual inspections. And then again, the applicant shall obtain and maintain a city of Tarpon, a Tarpon Springs business tax license for the use. If the business tax receipt lapses for a period of more than six months, a new review for the conditional use will be required. And that's subject to the conditions of your of, of a conditional use in your um, land development code. Uh, with that, uh, the planning board did see hear this application and they did um, recommend approval unanimously. And I can answer any questions that you might have on this. Questions? Uh, yes. So. I see this, uh, you know, as residential, uh, rented as a single living. Is that for family use or single use? It's a single family residential unit, so it could be used by a single person, it could be used by a couple, it could be used, be used by a family. So this whole house could be used by one person? Correct. It's meant to, it's meant to be used as a single family unit. All right. Thank you. Commissioner Donovan? Yeah, I was just curious, how many of these conditional use types for the seasonal short-term rentals do we currently allow? Um, we currently have, at least since I've been here in the four years that I've been here, we have approved at least three, especially in the special area plan. Now, they're in different locations throughout the city, but you probably have more that, have, that are out there. And then other than code enforcement, is there any way to regulate how long people are staying at this house, just so that it's almost kind of not like a conditional use to be like an Airbnb type, or is it just the trust that it's going to be a seasonal rental? It's based on the definition in the uh, SAP, which basically defines them for short-term use. Okay. It, it doesn't really define a, a, a period of time. So there's no time period in terms of five weeks, whatever? No. Oh, okay. That's in the general code. This is the special airplane is a little different. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Mr. Carter, do you have a question? Yes, I do. Uh, Heather, across Pinellas Avenue, this would be permitted. Am I right in that, saying that? Like, uh, you don't have to necessarily come. To yeah, the in some of the use? transects, you allow for a use, as a use by right, and other transects, you wanna you wanna control for, or you've asked in the past as a board to control for the compatibility question. So this just happens to be a transect where it requires a conditional use. But yeah, you are correct. In some of the other districts, it is allowed by right. Okay, so uh, this house is like two properties off. Pinellas Avenue, am I correct in saying that? Mm -hmm. Okay, good observation. Uh, and my understanding is this this is actually an application so they can do Airbnb and VBRO. Am I correct in saying that? More than likely. You have to ask the applicant how they're marketing it. I don't know okay. the answer to that, but I would I would assume so. Okay, thanks for clarifying. Mayor, do you have any questions? The uh, question that I have is just in benefit of the public, 
what areas do we have available for something like that? Well, the majority of the special area plan, depending upon where people would like to, to put one of these, they would need to come in and talk to myself or my staff and go over the low property locations because you have a variety of transects that it's allowed in and you have some transects that it's not allowed in and you have some zoning districts that it's allowed in some zoning districts that it's not allowed in. So um, it's something that you, it's really unique to um, the, the particular property. So they really need to come in and talk to us. Thank you. Uh, I believe that um, we need places like that to uh, attract more visitors to Carver Springs and I'm glad that we're able to provide the service. To listen someplace. <coughs> Is the applicant here today? Mr. Fruits, Roger Fruits. Does anybody from the public want to speak on this particular item? Ms. Protos? Yeah, I need to swear you in when you come back down here. You could raise your right hand and be sworn under oath. You swear the testimony we're about to give is going to be the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth? As far as I can remember. Okay, and if you could state your yes. name and your address, Anita please. Protus, 901 Bay Shore. Thank you. Right. Either in the 80s or the 90s, we used to have tourist homes, especially out in the Sunset Hills around the school. We had a lot of trouble with foreign families coming, uh, walking around the pools with no clothes on, parents complaining their children were watching these people, parties all night, and problems. At that time, we did pass, if I'm not mistaken, an ordinance about uh, tourist homes and renting out homes for people for a certain amount of time. Uh, then we had an agency in New York and one in California that was renting homes here to send their tourists here who would go to the travel agency to come to Florida. They'd come to Tarpon. And, and a couple of times the police had to go to some of these homes there were problems. Um, I'm asking the commission to look at what we have with the zoning and secure these homes around neighborhoods. This house is the old Jukes home, not the one on Tarpon Avenue where they lived before, right down the street from where I grew up. These are beautiful homes, and they're big homes that you can rent out, but it's a neighborhood. And that's what we've got to be very careful of is the neighborhood. And it is in an old section of Tarpon where there are some historic homes. I don't know if this one uh, came under the historic designation or not. But I think it's something we have to look at to protect the residents of Tarpon and their neighborhoods with people coming in. And yes, we do want them here, but I think we have about 300 houses in Tarpon Springs that are being rented out. And we've also talked about uh, uh, when Don Scholl came up with his house wanting to rent out on the bayou. And this is where we're gonna fall through the cracks and have some trouble. It's coming. So as commissioners and mayor and the city manager of Tarpon Springs with our city attorney, we need to look at our zoning, what we want, and how we're going to do it and regulate it because St. Pete, Clearwater, Dunedin, they've all had problems with this. I don't know these people. I don't know what they're going to do, who they're going to bring in, but we have to be very cautious about our community and what comes into our residential sections. Thank you. Um, any, anyone else from the public want to speak? There being none, this has been brought back to you then, a Mayor, the resolution and staff recommendation with conditions. Okay. Are there any, uh, any other commission comments? Chair will detain a motion for resolution 2019-17. Make a motion to approve. Second. Okay, I just want to make sure that the motion includes staff recommendation, which include the conditions, or was it just the resolution itself? Uh, absolutely includes a staff recommendation, um, and significantly want to, or especially want to highlight the business tax. Um, that's an important aspect. If we're going to put this in a conditional use, we want to make sure that they're registering with the city and paying their due taxes. But it's going to include all those conditions and uh, one through three. Okay, thank you. Yes, second. Roll call. Commissioner Donovan? Yes. Commissioner Carr? Yes. Bieber? Yes. Meryl Yes. 
Next is item number 25, resolution 2019-18, the application 19-36. This is condition of use single family for uh, 412 West Orange. And this is also quasi judicial. The city attorney will read the title. <coughs> this is resolution 2019-18, a resolution of the city of Tarpon Springs, Florida. Approving application number 19-36, requesting a conditional use permit to allow construction of a second single family resident residence at 410 East Tarpon Avenue, lot nine and west half of lot eight, block one, Fernald's LS subdivision, located on the south side of Tarpon Avenue between South Gross Avenue and South Levis Avenue in the T4A district of the special area plan providing for findings, providing for conditions, and providing an effective date. That was reading of resolution 2019-18 by title only. And as you said, it is a quasi-judicial hearing. Heather, you've already been sworn in. You can make the presentation. Anyone else is here on this, e this evening to speak on this issue? Okay. You've already been sworn under oath. It'll be considered to be continued. Anyone else? Okay. Heather, did you want to make your presentation? Sure. Um, this application is for Mark Wood. Um, this is actually a historic property. Um, the other one was not. This is a historic property, but it's also in the special area plan. It has the same requirements in this transact for them to come forward for a conditional use. This one's a little bit different because it's a secondary unit going on the property versus a, a, a just a single family, existing single family home being converted. So there's an existing single family home on the property and then there's going to be a small cottage that's going to be built. The, your, again, your special area plan, that's the intention of it. The intention of that special area plan is to provide for additional housing options and choices along with different uses um, in a mixing, of a mixing of uses in the neighborhood. So with that, there was one um, issue when this actually was previously done. The resolution was mis- um, uh, was mislabeled uh, as 2018-18. Uh, it's actually 2019-18. It was just a, a, a Scribner's error for the staff, but I want to bring that to your attention. Um, with that, again, the, this particular property, um, it's actually been through HPB already. He wanted to make sure that the cottage um, that he was proposing could would make it through the that, that staff approval or that sorry that um, board approval before he brought it before you for um, actual action on the on the additional unit. Um, so he's actually secured his um, HEB approval at this point. There's um, probably more backup than we normally get because of the HEB approval um, in here. So you can see the elevations of the the proposed residence of what he's actually proposing. Um, it, there's a site plan in here that shows where it's going to be. There's existing on the property um, a su sufficient area for parking, so we're not concerned about any additional um, parking that he would need. Again, these are meant to function like s residential homes. So he's meant to have the ma minimum, he has to meet the minimum requirement of the parking in this particular case. I know that we talked about this commissioner car. Um, it's one, it's 1 1.5, so he needs three for, the, for total for the two units. So he's got that um, between his garage and uh, the areas that he's showing for parking. So we're, we're not worried about um, parking. He's meeting all of the other criteria required in the special area plan. A matter of fact, the access is taken in the back of the property, which is encouraging. We're actually getting the intention of the special area plan to start being realized. Um, so this is, this is something that staff is very encouraged to see um, occurring um, in the area, and we're recommending approval of this particular application. I believe there's some conditions on this too. Let me get to that page so I can read those into the record. Okay, um, so again, the conditional use uh, will expire within one year of approval if a building permit is not issued and the applicant shall work with the city staff to determine the appropriate improvements to alley, um, not necessarily paving, but something to make the surface more permanent and stable. Again, this alleyway is not, um, it's got some issues to it, so we need to make sure with Public Works that there was a plan at one time to pave portion of that, I and mean, I'm not sure if it went down this far. So we're looking into that with Public Works, and we handle that at the time of building permit. If they need to improve the roadway, then we include that in their building permit application. And with that, I can answer any questions. Any questions from the commission? Just have one. Uh, for. Do we need to, uh, for number two, do we need to be a little more specific? I feel like this is pretty vague um, about the applicant shall work with the city staff to determine appropriate improvement to the alley, not necessarily paving, but something to make 
the surface more permanent and stable. Uh, is that an area that we need to ask the applicant to, I mean, we're just asking them to work with the city, so that can mean anything. We're putting rock down, gravel down, paving, concrete. Generally, I've deferred in the past with these to the Public Works Department on what they've wanted to do, and we requested paving on one, and we get very specific on the condition they need to come back to you. If Public Works doesn't want to support paving, I would hate to have them come back just because the condition, he's already spent a lot of time in HPB. So, I mean, we can get that specific if you would like, but that's really the concern that I have is Public Works hasn't really given us an answer because they don't have formal building plans to start construction. So that's really when they activate. We just send them out usually to take a look. Okay, so we could put something in the, in the lines of work with city staff slash Public Works Department um, to determine the best surface for the alleyway for improvement. Public Works Department is part of your city staff. I think it's all inclusive. Okay, it's encompassing then? Yeah, it's all okay. inclusive. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. Thank you. Any other questions from the commissioner? No. Seeing none, is the applicant here tonight? Would you like to step forward? Make your presentation if you want to. You could raise your right hand when you get there. I need to swear you under oath. I swear the testimony you're about to give is going to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. If you could state your name and your address, please. Sure. My name is Stephanie Wood, and I live at 412 East Toppin Ave, Toppin Springs. My husband can't be here tonight. Mark, my brother-in-law, um, Fred, is here for us. So this, we dubbed it the Rose Cottage. Um, we're building it for my mother-in-law to live. She's getting older. She lives in Sarasota, and she's planning on coming up. So it has no intention to ever, um, if that doesn't even happen, um, to ever be used for Airbnb or anybody other than family, ever. So I just want to let you know. And as far as the road behind it, it's not paved. And we kind of really hope they don't pave it because it's that alley. So we don't want to incur a lot of traffic going behind there. Right now, when it gets used and you know a lot of potholes back there, we go out in our section and kind of even it up and put the dirt back in as it, as it washes away with all the rain and everything. But we really hope we get approved for this. And I know uh, my mother-in-law would really love it. Does the commission have any questions of the applicant? Seeing none, thank you. As, uh, I saw a hand, another hand. Uh, Nita, did you have uh, comments on this one? Okay, up here the mic if you can, please. You've already been sworn under oath. You're continued to be under oath. Could you state your name, please, and your address? Dear Protus, and I don't want to base sure. You're all going to know it by heart pretty soon. Uh, <laughs> I came because it's in it's it's a historic uh, uh, donation donation of a house. It's the old Jukes house with the dog trot in the middle. And um, the alley was put in years ago for Vincent Funeral Home. And during Charlie Barnes' time, before I was ever in office, it was paved and then they started putting gravel in when it started breaking down. So years ago it did have pavement, not like what we have now, but they did top coat it, I guess you call it. And uh, it's, I drove back there today to see it is in very bad shape. Someone's uh, oil pan or something's gonna be taken off with the ruts in the road. But at that time, Charlie Barnes was on a program to pave all alleys in Tarpon Springs, and there are a lot of paved alleyways, or used to be, there's, there's still some now. But that's what used to be there, and I wanna thank you for uh, taking care of the home and uh, uh, preserving the home because these homes are very important. And I hope even the one on um, uh, the, the previous one, I hope that one also went through uh, the Historic Preservation Board. All these older homes that have been marked as historic homes need to be kept that way. And in the back you have the, the piece that was on the house so people will know that it is a historic home. And I just hope that y'all make sure when all these homes change for people to rent to live in and uh, are being altered in any way, which they're not altering the home, that everything, even on the property, does have to go through the historic preservation. Thank you. Anyone else want to speak on this issue? Seeing none, it's back to you, Mayor. Uh, the staff recommendation with, of approval with conditions. Thank you. Are there any commission comments? I need a motion. Uh, you've got Commissioner Sieber to comment. Oh, you have a question? Uh, 
Yeah, I just wanted to say Rose Cottage sounds amazing, and uh, you've already gone through historical preservation board and, and done all your due diligence, uh, and I'm in, in approval of this, uh, and I can make a motion if you like uh, to approve resolution 2019-18. With staff recommendations and conditions? Yes. Okay. I just want I'll to second that. Okay. We have a first and second. Roll call, please. Commissioner Donovan? Yes. Commissioner Carr? Yes. Commissioner Sieber? Yes. Mel Hoosis? Yes. Next is item number 26, resolution 2019-18, the application 18-159, for additional use, <laughs> storage trust property, uh, 1730 South Pinellas Avenue. This is pausing the uh, additional, and the city attorney will read the uh, resolution. Uh, Resolution. Thank you. This is resolution 2019-19, resolution of the City of Tarpon Springs, Florida, approving application 18-159, requesting conditional use approval to expand an existing mini warehouse use by converting 16,335 square feet of existing commercial retail space in two existing buildings to mini storage use, resulting in a total of 51,085 square feet of mini storage use located at 1730 South Pinellas Avenue in the Highway Business HB Zoning District, providing for findings, providing for conditions, and providing for an effective date. That was the reading of Resolution 2019-19 by Title only is quasi-judicial. Is there anyone here that's gonna speak on this particular agenda item? Okay, if you could stand up, raise your right hand, or be sworn under oath, I'm gonna swear everybody out at the same time, then you, you swear the testimony you're gonna give is gonna be the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. I do. Okay, thank you. So city staff would begin uh, with the president. What would you uh, like to do, if you don't mind? Sure. Uh, Vice Mayor Terrapani is not here today. He's absent due to the illness. But he sent an email regarding this item number 26, and I will ask the city clerk to uh, read it uh, for the record. For item number 26, I concur with staff and the Planning and Zoning Board that this application should be denied as many storage fronting on all 19 is not compatible with the balance of the properties and uses fronting on the Alt-19 quarter. The existing retail commercial office is much more compatible with surrounding business and uses. Okay, so Heather, would you like to make a presentation? Over to me, sure. Heather Earl, our Planning and Zoning Director and staff to this application. Um, okay, so this application is actually an expansion of an existing um, mini storage facility um, that's actually behind this building. This building is actually a, a plaza that fronts right on Alt-19. Um, and uh, the request here has been just to uh, basically close in um, the storefronts and provide storage, uh, but still preserve the, the frontage so it appears to still be a um, functional plaza. Um, staff's biggest concern is uh, we spent a lot of time sending staff and people from this commission. I believe Jacob came several times with us down for the corridor study that was done over the course of the last several years. Part of that um, study was looking at what we want to see for land uses along Alt-19 and how those land uses will interact with the roadway. Um, one of the big things that came out of that is the residents that were there from our area were really interested in having the ability to walk to small businesses and provide for that walkable uh, community. So that's something that we want to continue to provide for. Staff's not convinced that this is compatible, um, this expansion of this public storage, putting that kind of in the middle and mix of um, that corridor. On the you know the southern fringe of the of the community, we're really trying to figure out you know and, and see the businesses. I know there's a business coming in right across the street that's actually uh, some young gentlemen moving in from Clearwater that'll be coming forward to ask for an annexation of their building. Um, they're looking to build a structure that's going to be you know up on the street and that meets the criteria for their district. Highway Business District does allow for storage only by conditional use. And so you just recently approved one up on Alt-19, the large Nitneal storage. They came back for a modification not too long ago um, to modify the building. And we're, and staff feels that that's the more appropriate location. Um, it's, it's easy access from the highway. We're not really interested, and we really don't feel it's compatible for this particular area of the community. 
We also have some concerns with um, the aesthetics, the colors and things that they're choosing for the actual um, structure itself. That's not something that we really wanna have these bright hues and that type of thing with nothing there because you're only gonna be going into storage units. You're not gonna be going into a plaza, um, you know, like you do just to the south of this, which is where you have Little Thai Cafe and there's a yoga studio and there's a lot of those smaller businesses here. We wanna provide for that small business community along Alt 19 to support those businesses and those uses uh, north uh, in, in downtown. So that staff's concern, um, this was uh, uh, presented to the planning board. Um, in June on the 17th, and planning board um, went with staff's recommendation, which was denial of the application. And I can answer any questions that you might have on this particular application. Commission questions? Seeing none, okay. There being no questions, does the applicant wanna make a presentation? Okay. Sir, if you could state your name and your business address when you get there. You are under oath. Good evening, members of the board. My name is Matt Femal with Kimley Horn and Associates, located at 655 North Franklin Street in Tampa, Florida. And we are here tonight to present our conditional use application to convert 16,355 square feet of commercial retail to mini warehouse. I'd like to stress we're only requesting approval of our use, which is allowed in our zoning with, with your approval. Public storage owns a 2.74 acre property located at 1730 South Pinellas Avenue. The rear of the property is currently operating as a mini a warehouse with the front of the property serving a, street, a strip retail. Public storage is currently operating under a conditional use permit that was previously approved to allow the mini warehouse in the rear of the property. At the Planning Commission meeting, there was a two-part question after closing of public comments that may have led to a misinterpretation of our plan. The question was yes or no, the use is not in the best interest of or is compliant with code with the answer from staff being correct. We want to clarify that we have been working with staff since April of 2018 to come up with a plan that meets current code requirements. As you can see per city staff report, the project meets all technical and site requirements of the land development code. We work with staff on the following improvements that will enhance the property and enhance the corridor. We're providing an enhanced storefront appearance aimed to comply with the city of Tarpon Springs objective for the area. Um, this would include locking the doors and blocking out the windows to give a retail appearance while allowing for the operation of self storage. We're providing enhanced landscaping on the front buffer. Um, we're installation of two landscape islands to install trees to break up Rosa Park and meet code of no more than 10 parking stalls. We're installing a new internal ADA connectivity to public right of way, including the existing bus stop out front. We're restriping the parking lot um, to relocate some of the AD st ADA stalls to a friendlier location. We're adding a dumpster enclosure to screen the, uh, the current dumpster and we're removing the existing sidewalk that's located along Pinellas Avenue and installing a new sidewalk that meets ADA. The existing sidewalk's in pretty poor condition. The next slide shows the existing buffer and store from, front from Pinellas Avenue. We're proposing to add perimeter of shrubs, trees, sod, and to upgrade the irrigation system to provide an enhanced view that meets the goals of the corridor. Here's, your, here's some pictures of some slides um, that's showing what the, uh, what the proposed improvements will look like um, once we get approved, if we get approved with our conditional use permit. These next slides show that the, what the enhanced storefront will look like and it's gonna mimic the elevations of a retail storefront. With approval of the conditional use permit, my client will be able to fill the empty space with market-driven demand that will benefit the community. The storage space is currently 95% occupied with the retail space at 65% capacity. We have heard from staff that they are opposed to the conditional use op application because we were taking potential re retail space out of the quarter. We have verified there is over 278,000 square feet of vacant retail space along the Pinellas Avenue corridor. The attached map shows the, uh, shows the vacant retail businesses along the corridor. Um, we've been, it's kind of hard to read, but we've identified where there's vacant businesses and then their occupancy rates. We're proposing to remove 16,000 square foot of retail space out of a market that has available capacity, allowing those potential retailers to be served in locations by landlords that focus on retail. Public storage is in the storage business and not the retail business. The conditional use approval will allow public storage to expand and operate a business that is needed in the community and allow the other retail owners to operate types of businesses which they are experts. And we just went through a site and provided some flyers of uh, available businesses that are, um, could serve the retail demands of the community. Um, with that, I'd like to uh, hand my presentation over to uh, Rick, who works with public storage. Thank you.
name is Rick McKeever. I live at 650 Island Way, Clearwater. I have been with public storage for 30 years and I have lived in Clearwater for all my life. I've spent a lot of time in Tarpon Springs and I frequent uh, the downtown area quite often. So I drive the Pinellas County uh, or the Pinellas Corridor quite often. So I'm gonna break it down, it's pretty simple. This property um, is, is gonna look just like it looks now. If you don't like the colors, we'll change them. We'll leave them the way they are. We're gonna increase the enhancement of the landscaping. We're going to make it look much more better than it is and then what it has to be per code. Um, as he mentioned, there is right now advertised over 287,000 square feet of, of space, of rentable space, commercial space on your Pinellas, uh, on Pinellas uh, Avenue. Um, the the 16,000 may seem like a drop in the bucket, but I've had several commercial guys, because I called all everybody that had commercial space, are, are saying, yeah, we're having trouble keeping and maintaining good tenants in our commercial spaces. You, you guys have had uh, some great growth down there. Uh, you've had a new Winn-Dixie Plaza put in, but the, the uh, Manatee Plaza is suffering terribly, 100,000 square feet of, of vacant space. In your corridor plan, there is more commercial space to come. So I'm trying to help the community. I'm in the storage business. I'd like to maintain the storage business. 95% occupancy there, 65% occupancy in our commercial side. So um, I think that the, the corridor will be enhanced because of this change, not, it won't detract from it. Um, and that's ba about as basic as I can make it. And I thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. Before you sit down, there, are there any questions from the commission? No. How long has public storage owned this property? I believe, well, I've been here uh, 30 years and they've owned it since then. Okay. So it, they've let it get to the state that it is currently with the parking lot and the discussion is all the upgrades, et cetera, well, the, right? The, the state that it's in meets current code. I mean, it, it can stay this way with the exception of some trees and some foliage in the front, but the, we don't have to do the sidewalk unless we repair the building. We don't have to do any of the other enhancements unless we go to a full-blown repair. Um, and I, I, I fully believe that if you look at the nursing home across the street, it's beautiful. They've done a very nice job with landscaping and they don't have commercial real estate. Um, they're just, uh, it's just, a, it's a good use, but it's, it's, I'm trying to make the property better than it is, than it's ever been and that it will ever be. I don't have any further questions. Any other questions from the commission? No. Okay. Is there anyone else from the, thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. Anyone else from the public wanted to uh, talk on this agenda item? Um, Heather, did you want to make any um, further summary comments? Okay. No, I'm just available for any questions if you have them. Okay. So, Mayor, it's back to you. Thank you. And the Commission. Back to the Commission. Uh, I have a comment to make. Uh, I think storage uses are very desirable on US 19. On, all, on alternate 19, we're encouraging to have small businesses. Small businesses is the backbone of our local economy and this is what I will support. Uh, mini storage to me is not desirable on the urban core and it's, I cannot support this application. Any comments? Ready to make a motion. Uh, yeah, I believe that this is a property owner trying to make a, a positive difference on their property. Um, and I think just because it might not fit our vision for the area doesn't mean that there's there's not room to adapt that um, personally I, I think it's just a compelling argument to, to consider how much retail space is available along alternate 19 um, I mean I, I think they mentioned the Manatee Plaza is um, largely empty um, so I, I think this is a business that's been around here for a long time trying to make their property better thank you ready for motion yeah, motion uh, to have, uh, you have yeah uh, they also mentioned that um, we could work with them as far as coloring uh, and painting and those, those other things that uh, we may want to uh, work with them on. I feel that there is a lot of retail space that's open in this town and it's not getting filled. Um, 
and it's staying vacant. So this would be an upgrade to to Alt-19, I think, um, and bring in more tax base. So uh, I would approve for this to go through. Commissioner Carr, you say you want to make a motion? Yeah, uh, just for some discussion also, um, it's currently being proposed to black out the windows. It's going to give a, a premise that it looks like the buildings are shut down when you have blackout windows. Uh, I would have some concerns as a commissioner when you're coming into the gateway of Tarpon Springs from the south, that's what you're looking at um, as a whole. I don't think this necessarily fits the area of Tarpon Springs. There's already a mini storage back there at 95%. Um, yes, it's not occupied on the retail side, but it's a pretty rough looking plaza if you haven't driven by it and seen it. Um, the applicant also discussed that they've owned it for quite some time, if I recall. So there are some concerns about upkeep and maintenance too. And we have to remember this is a large public corporation who's within our Tarpon Springs district. So if they haven't upkept their property currently today, how do you expect them to upkeep the property for further years down the road? But coming back to the premise of it, I still don't think as a commissioner that it fits the area. Although there's enough public storage behind there, the mixed use is also a nice thing to have along this corridor as well. Uh, you've got multiple apartments coming in. You're probably going to see Manatee Plaza that was referenced multiple times redeveloped uh, into a mixed use residential at some point as well. Um, so that's a significant amount of that square footage that was brought up. Uh, so I do want to bring up that's 100 plus thousand square feet that would be taking off probably the retail roles in this area and create more of a desire for this area from a retail standpoint. I'm not in real estate, but this is just a perspective from living here my whole life and the corridor of Alter 19. Uh, so I do have some concerns on this. So I would make the motion to deny the resolution 2019-19 uh, tonight. Can I, can I ask a question? Sure. Uh, would it make a difference if they didn't have the blackout windows? No, <laughs> it, it wouldn't to me. Still, then, okay. Yeah, it's an empty plaza, what it turns out to be. Okay, we have a motion to have a second. No second. Motion done. We have another motion. Motion to approve this plot. Second. It would be a motion to approve resolution 2019-19 pursuant to, actually there were no staff recommendations other than denial. Mm -hmm. So it would be to approve the resolution. That's your motion. Right. Okay. Okay. So we have first. Second. Roll call please. Commissioner Donovan? Yes. Commissioner Carr? No. Commissioner Sieber? Yes. Mayor Lahuzis? No. Okay, the motion fails. Thank you. Next is item number 27, resolution 2019 20, application 1970, temporary one way county, county club court removal on street parking on. Uh, uh, County Club Court and south side of St. Andrews Drive. This is by the hospital, the back side of the hospital. So I'll read the attorney. This is the resolution. Thank you, Mayor. Resolution 2019-20, a resolution of the Board of Commissioners of the City of Tarpon Springs, Florida, requesting one-way Country Club Court uh, remove an on-street parking from Country Club Court and on-street parking from south side of St. Andrews Drive for a period of not to exceed 18 months. And it will expire on January 1st, 2021, to facilitate the relocation of the ambulance bays to the south side of the hospital during renovation of the emergency room and providing for an effective date. That was reading resolution 2019 20 by title only. So the resolution pretty much says it all. Um, what we're looking to do here is the hospital is now finally moving forward with the renovation projects at the emergency room. In order for that to happen, we've got to relocate the ambulance bays from where they currently are to the south side of the hospital. We met with Sunstar and the other um, ambulance providers, um, our fire folks, our, our police folks, um, and the hospital representatives to come up with a plan that would work um, and still make it safe for combined traffic because we're going to have traffic that's not only going to have ambulances on it, but also this facility, this roadway currently has um, you know, regular vehicle traffic on it. 
So we um, have come up with this one-way plan um, of country club court for a short temporary time of the 18 months that they expect to be in construction. Um, and that is essentially what you see here. Part of that is relocating the on-street parking and, and prohibiting it for that time period to make it safer. So the travel would be from Pinellas Ave, um, e uh, basically east into, into the existing parking lots. Then you would go proceed south through the parking lots onto St. Andrews that would stay two-way but it's been a little, I guess, restricted and congested down on, on St. Andrews Way because there's been parking on both sides of the street. Um, I know that uh, our partners at the hospital are going to work with their staff and kind of put move their staff to the back parking lot behind um, the hospital, as many of the staff as they can, so that they can eliminate you know some of that parking without really affecting that. But we still want to provide signage to notice the public because this has been parking allowed on the roadways here for some time. So with that, that's what staff is really trying to accomplish here. This is a short term, um, a short term project. We're essentially asking for a few of the uh, ground markers to be put on just to kind of direct traffic, but the majority of this will just be signage that can be removed because we don't want to, <coughs> excuse me, permanently one way, that <coughs> excuse me, one way road and make that a one way road permanently. So. <coughs> <coughs> I think we've exceeded my capacity to speak tonight. Uh, with that, that's really what the staff is trying to accomplish here. Um, I know that the hospital will be bringing forward additional plans uh, over the next few months with the with what they plan on doing. I um, mean, you'll be seeing those um, in a future presentation. So this is just the preliminary step. I want to get their ambulance bay relocated and constructed before they actually start really working inside the hospital because they've got to redo corridors and all kinds of stuff to actually get to the to the emergency room from this location. So it's going to take them some preliminary work to get there before they can actually move the ER entrance. With that, I can answer any questions that you have. Thank you. I really don't have any questions. I just want to comment that these changes are necessary uh, to be done in order to have construction begin for the uh, new ER for the hospital. It's very necessary. But also, I am very glad and thankful to the dental office of Dr. Allen and Dr. Johnson for working with us and to accomplishing that. So, thanks to both of them. Any questions or comments? I've got one or a couple questions for Heather. Uh, just for clarification, um, if, if we're directing traffic through the parking lot. That's not a road, right? That's correct, but they're owned by, the, they're all city property, so we've kind of worked with the attorney since this is a temporary um, situation. We're not really concerned about thing about the them rotting through the parking lots, except for the fact that I need some ground markers. So I've asked the hospital. This is the the plan that they gave me because they didn't realize it needed to go to public hearing. Sure. Um, but there'll be an actual construction drawing, and when that construction drawing comes through, they're actually going to put ground markers in that we'll have to have milled off later. Um, because we need to have that directional flow here. The ambulances actually will come in Country Club and go behind the hospital to exit on the other exit. Okay. The only people that will be coming onto St. Andrews are actually the regular vehicular traffic. Okay. Uh, I do know there's a lot of parking that happens on St. Andrews. It's pretty tight to get there on a normal day. Um, obviously, there's a demand for parking in this area. Was there any discussions um, about putting a temporary parking lot at all uh, in the old motel? Lot the the hospital plans on utilizing that old hotel lot as preliminary staging to do the preliminary design here, and then they'll be having some parking there. But what I was told by the, the dental office was the majority of the parking there is hospital staff. So we've asked um, the CEO to look into that and possibly relocate people to the back parking lot. I realize it's an inconvenience to have to walk across the trail to come to work, but in this particular thing, I'd rather have emergency vehicles have access to the ER um, and inconvenience folks for 18 months um, and have a safe facility. So that's really, that's really what we've asked him to do, and he didn't seem to have any concern with that. Um, apparently, it's just something people don't want to use that back parking lot. Yeah. So yeah, they will use the front, that front piece, because they're not actually going to start their development for their future office for some time. That's kind of on the back burner. Great. Thank you. Any other commission comments? Are there any public comments of this item? No comments? The chair will retain the motion. Move to approve. Second. 
Roll call. Commissioner Donovan? Yes. Commissioner Carr? Yes. Commissioner Sieber? Yes. Malahuzas? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Have a good evening. is item number uh, 28, reconsideration of uh, South Spring Boulevard sidewalk vote, Commissioner Sieber. Um, Vice Mayor Terry Payne sent us an email and he's uh, asking us to read it for the record. Uh, City Clerk, if you please do that. Item number 28, my original position has not changed and I would encourage the commission to move forward, not backwards, with installing the sidewalk as directed to staff and legally rectified in a formal vote. The record will reflect a commissioner posted the question to our city attorney if the item needed to be re-advertised or if we can vote on the motion and second, which we were advised we could legally vote and we did. Thank you. Commissioner Sieber, you place on the agenda you want to talk about? Yes, thanks. Uh, does anyone need an explanation on uh, reconsideration of a vote? I just wanted to ask that question. Well, Neil, but I will ask the uh, city attorney to. I'd be happy to do it. So, um, under Robert's rules of order, which it, it, the rules that, that govern what you do here at the city, Robert's rules specifically provide motions for reconsideration are motions that have to be made at the same meeting where the motion took place that you want to reconsider or at the next subsequent meeting, which would be this meeting. The motion for reconsideration would have to be made by one of the people who voted uh, in the positive matter, in other words, on the winning side of the motion. It's my understanding that Commissioner Sieber was the only the dissenting vote, and therefore she does not have the ability to make a motion for reconsideration. She has placed it on the agenda to, um, to talk to you about the possibility of one of the other four of you making a motion to reconsider. There would have to be a second. Um, and then there would have to be a vote on that particular motion. If the motion is not made or the motion fails, um, then the action that took place at the last meeting stands. If the motion is made and seconded and passes, then the prior motion at the last meeting relative to the sidewalk issue would be put back on the table, which would mean that you can either consider it tonight um, or you can consider it at some future meeting. That would be your your option so what we need to do is ask for motions first if we're going to get it or not um, whether you want to allow the commissioner to make a presentation before you uh, call for a motion that is your up to you mayor well since uh, it was placed on the agenda by Commissioner Sieber I think it's a good idea thank you uh, I, I do have some comments and would like to also um, ask for public comments when I'm when I'm done before we make any motion I think we got to get a motion first before we can see what you think there are a lot of people who waited a long time to be here for public comments so I think that they deserve the respect to be able to speak um, before we we make a decision do you want to explain what you uh, yes um, I have several reasons for bringing this uh, votes back on the one-way uh, South Spring traffic study uh, for reconsideration. First of all, that's exactly what was on the agenda. It was the, uh, the vote to ask Bob if we wanted to uh, continue the one-way st study um, on South Spring. Uh, and that was on the agenda, not the sidewalks. Secondly, I think a motion to add approval to connect sidewalks on the east side of the street was completely the wrong thing to do. I think that was bad government and lacked uh, complete transparency. There was no notification to the residents that may be affected or was connecting the sidewalks included in the agenda. Actually, the decision to not connect the sidewalks on the east side was made by the previous board last January. At our last meeting, any residents who 
were in the audience regarding the one-way vote were completely confused by the motion made. To me, it felt like we snuck in another vote and did not allow residents who might have been affected to be heard. I'm sure all of our residents would like notification on decisions made by our board when it affects them and would like the opportunity to speak. The reconsideration on this vote is about doing the right thing for our residents and about transparency. This board has spoken about transparency, but did the opposite with that vote. My third reason for reconsideration of this vote is that we would be spending ninety to $100,000 to connect the small section of sidewalks on the, on the east side. When will we have another 100000 to do the survey on the west side and to submit our findings to the Army Corps? In fact, we flood all around Wickham Bayou during high tides and heavy rain. When are we going to address these concerns, which I feel have become quite urgent and are possibly affecting our property values? In closing, I would ask that one of you make the motion to reconsider your last vote. If the reconsideration passes, I would suggest tabling this item to the next meeting. And Mr. Trask, <laughs> uh, would you please explain to us if the process that was used the last time legally was? So uh, the, the question came up at that meeting with my associate Rob Escherfelder <laughs> as to whether or not it was legal or proper to have the motion that was made. And the answer was is it, it was not illegal and not improper for that motion to be made at that time. You were conducting city business. There was no need for notice. There was no need to have it on the agenda. Um, you would only require it to be noticed and on the agenda uh, for um, good government, uh, transparency, or quasi hearings or other public hearings. But there is no legal requirement um, for it to be on the agenda and there was no impropriety by having the motion made. It was legal and proper at the time. And, and my concern, as I said earlier, is transparency and good government. Um, we did not give the public opportunity to, to be here that had anything to do with the sidewalks. Um, and even though it was legal, I just you know, have to differ that we were not transparent and we did not allow the public to be here uh, when usually it's advertised what's on the agenda and public can come uh, and speak on, on what they see on the agenda. So as, as far as, as I'm concerned, it was legal, yes, but um, not transparent. And uh, I just feel for all these people that were not able to be here because they, and the ones that were, were totally confused about what we were voting on because we were here to vote on the, the one way. Uh, also, using the funding for the west side and doing a survey i think is uh something that we need to do um, but i do have a letter i'd like to maybe uh irene if you'd like to read from mr malone uh for public record and then would like to hear from the public mayor i've got a question for the city manager that's go ahead um does this need to come back before the board for um approval for funding of this project Which one? The side. The sidewalk and the um, after and we, the west side. Um, a design. After we do the design, we we probably have to bring it back for final for approval. Okay. Thanks. It would be unfair having all the residents here that are wanting to speak, uh, because if we ask for motion, and if it dies, it's over with. So I would like to. Uh, Take it to the, uh, I'd like to ask for public comments if anybody's interested to express their opinion. I'm asking for public comment. I would also like to have read in the record the letter that we got from Mr. Malone. You know, at, at some point. <laughs> Good evening, Susan Kikta, 214 Earl Street, Tarpon Springs. Well, this item was on the agenda and voted on, the item about the sidewalks, in January. It was voted on previously and it was settled at that time. And it was properly noticed. We did have people come 
um, voiced their concerns at that time, and the, the uh, commission listened to them. Um, and, I, and as Commissioner Sieber had stated, staff at that time was directed to do a study um, regarding across the street, what we can do for pedestrians across the street. So I was kind of confused and upset when I saw at our last meeting, there was another um, item that was discussed, and then all of a sudden something came out about the sidewalks, and it was uh, it was voted on again without even being noticed. And you know, again, all of you up here talk about transparency. Well, this was not transparent to our residents, and I think this was a very underhanded move by the commission. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jean Lindsay. I live at 305 South Spring Boulevard. It's kind of feeling like Groundhog Day here now. This is my third time here speaking on this same subject. Um, first, I wanted to address, which I didn't know this until Mr. Trask talked about it, that if something is brought up at one meeting and then we want to rediscuss it, it needs to be brought up as a motion to reconsider within the next meeting. We voted on this, or you voted on this in January. It was finalized, as far as I understood, in January. Nobody made a motion to bring it back up at the next meeting. So how are we able to go six months and then bring it up again without any notice to the public and change the vote? Is there any explanation on that, Mr. Trask, that you can give me that we could do that, that that's allowed? This is not a question and answer period. Okay. So you need to make your statements and okay. then the commission will decide. All right. So. Um, there's, I, I do agree that there was no transparency. There was no, I felt like we were coming to vote on one thing or to be heard. When I got up here and to speak last time, it was on the one-way street. I did not even speak on the sidewalk because I didn't even know that until after the public comments were made. Once the public comments were made, it was cut off for public comments and then you changed what the vote was gonna be about. There was no other items today. There were a lot of votes. I never saw that happen today. I'm just a resident. I'm not an attorney. I'm not a commissioner. I'm not a politician. But it just seemed very underhanded. Um, I also received today, Irene sent me some information. I asked for all the information that we had on public record that has gone out in the past. There were two different letters that I saw that said that they were sent to residents on our street. One of them was um, dated in September that they were going to have surveyors out and actually get with residents and um, view how it was going to affect our trees, driveways, mailboxes, and existing surfaces. And then they also sent another one in December 21st. And I, as a resident there, I'm very passionate about this. I would notice if those letters came to my house. I never received either one of those, nor did I ever see a surveyor come to my house. Um, never saw any survey flags, anything. So I'm not sure where the transparency is. I feel like we're being underhanded here in a lot of different ways. I do say, agree that the money ought to be spent when everybody agreed, even at the last meeting, that we need to look at putting the sidewalks on the west side. I agree that we should be spending that money there. They agreed in January to spend the money to, or at least look into doing the sidewalks on the west side. I don't see anything that's been done since that time to evaluate that. So I appreciate your time. Thank you. Good evening. Is it still Tuesday? Yeah. <laughs> I guess it is. My name is Lou Esposito. And, uh, I have a home on South Spring Boulevard. Um, getting back with Mrs. Lindsay said, you know, we came to a meeting, it was voted on, it was voted down, and then all of a sudden another meeting came up and as a one-way street. Uh, I don't know what happened there. I think Mr. Carr wanted to go home, change things around a little bit, and all of a sudden we're voting on the sidewalks. I don't know how that happened. Tonight, sitting here, as long as we are, all I've heard was how are we gonna make Tarpon Springs beautiful? 
so many different ways people brought up, you folks brought up. Uh, we live in an area right there where it's hundreds of years old. Houses are beautiful on that street, you know. Why do we want to try to change that? Because something happened across the street that wasn't maybe done the right way. We had walkway on the other side of the street. I don't think we've exhausted our ways to find out what we need to do. And I think there are ways that can be done. I think maybe we need to get the state involved, Mr. Belarakis involved, maybe other than ourselves, and have somebody look into that. But uh, doing what we're talking about, I do not think that's the answer for sidewalks on the east side of the street. So uh, I, I hope that you reconsider and look at sidewalks or something else that could be done. And I, I, I really think that looking into the state is probably a very good uh, answer. So please take our consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Who's going to help? Anita Pros, 901 Bayshore Drive. I respect how they think, they're friends, and I respect them. But let me tell you something. What you did at the last meeting isn't wrong. That's your right to conduct your business. I know 20 years I've been on boards here and on the commission and mayor, we worked hard. You were in your right at how the meeting was conducted. They may not like it, they may not understand it, but you did the right thing and your attorney told you. It's up to you to decide what you want to do, but I want it understood here. They did not do anything underhanded. They did not do anything wrong. They acted within their rights. I know our city manager is not going to do something underhanded. The mayor isn't, and these commissioners aren't. And I don't like hearing uh, you being badmouthed for doing something wrong because you didn't. That's how these meetings and our business is conducted. People were here. They could have spoken more, but they didn't. Mr. Bill Arrakis is federal. He doesn't have jurisdiction with us except helping on grants. The state's not going to come in and help us. We take care of our own government, and we vote for these people, depending on them to do the right thing. You are correct in your con conduct that night. You did nothing wrong. Thank you. Costa Valley Kyotis, 538 West Cedar Street. I'd like to call a point of order, um, and hopefully Mr. Trask can answer this question. It's not a question and answer, but it's a point of order. I think there was a legitimate question asked by how, what happened between January and last week is different than what happened between last week and today. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? Mayor, excuse me, it's a point of order. You can't raise a point of order from the audience, Costa. It would have to be by can't one of the board members. The board. Thank you. Yeah, okay. I'm Ron Haddad, 334 Bay Street, uh, downtown Tarpon. We're just maybe 100 feet away from South Spring Boulevard. I'm not here to comment on what was done that was right. I know all of you and I respect your work and I, I trust that you're doing the right thing. Many of my neighbors live along the east side of South Spring Boulevard and the thought of having a sidewalk put just a few feet away from their homes is in their mind and I think rightly so, very, very disruptive to their lives. And I was here at the last meeting, and I think uh, the uh, commission approved a study to see if it would be appropriate to put a sidewalk on the west side. Uh, my feeling is why put something on the east side when we haven't come up with any conclusive resolution about the west side? 
which would be, in my mind, the far better location for a sidewalk. So thank you. Tim Kafalis, 205 Leafwood. I'm not questioning whether you had the legal right or the need to put it there. I'm just questioning that it wasn't on the agenda. And I wasn't here in January. I've been staying away from the city politics. But when I read in the paper what took place, it made the city look, look bad. And I had people call me that read the paper and said, what is going on in Tarpon? And um, I contacted uh, Rhea and I said, I, I don't understand this. She said, you know, come Tuesday night, it's gonna be on the agenda. Uh, my concern is not that whether you had the legal right or not, but if, why do we even have uh, these meetings if you can just go ahead and add things on it that weren't on there to begin with? Um, I think that you need to look at it. Do you even have easements to go onto that sidewalk? Um, I know I had a house on Holiday Drive and they had to re reroute all the utilities and they couldn't put a sidewalk there because they had no easements to come on, on that property. So we never, while I was there, had, had uh, sidewalks. But I think that you need to look at the impact on the trees because it said in the article that I read that there's trees in the street and it's gonna be an, a problem. Um, I think you need to take this back and reconsider. I would hope that somebody would reconsider and then have a, your, your full uh, board here, your full commission looking at it and say, we should do this the right way and have a vote. Maybe it'll come out the same, maybe it won't. But you need to do it to show the people that you do believe that they have a voice in government or they aren't gonna come here. They're gonna, they're gonna stop participating. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comments? My name is Patricia Haddad, 334 Bay Street, Tarpon Springs. Uh, I, uh, my husband just spoke. I support what he said um, about the reconsideration of Spring Boulevard sidewalk. And I hope that you discuss this and, um, and, and change the vote from what it was at the last meeting. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Are there any more public comments? Okay, it comes back to the commission, Commissioner Carr. I, I have a, I, I did request Dealing for Mr. I know, but I did request for Mr. Malone's uh, letter to be read out loud, because that was part of the public comments. Go ahead, that's fine. This is dated June 22nd uh, from David Malone, resident and owner of 319 South Spring Boulevard regarding upcoming vote on South Spring Boulevard sidewalk proposal. I am writing to express my views associated with the upcoming vote. I'm working in California this week and will not be able to attend in person. I have copied Jane Lindsay, one of my neighbors on the same street in hopes that she can ensure my voice is heard prior to the vote. When searching for a vacation retirement home, we specifically chose Florida and Tarpon Springs in particular, as we could trust that logic, logical rule of law would apply. We received notice on the first vote around this controversial sidewalk proposal late last year and took steps to work with our neighbors to ensure our views as a taxpayer were represented at the January 2019 meeting. We were pleased when common sense prevailed and the east side sidewalk proposal was defeated. Imagine my shock when I heard of the quasi-banana republic-type meeting earlier this month when the city overturned the legitimate vote in a rushed, virtually unpublicized forum. I am glad that various media sources called out that unfair process by which the second, and I dare to say borderline, illegally constituted meeting was held and pleased to hear that the city is reopening this discussion for proper transparent vote. I bought this property primarily because it was a beautiful front yard and views of the water. My belief was that this should, that a, should a sidewalk ever be deemed necessary, it would be placed on the west side closer to the water where pedestrians could also enjoy the great views as well. I'm sure the reason no sidewalk was ever considered on the east side for the past four to five decades at least was that 
there simply wasn't room for it without a significant impact on the personal enjoyment and space of residents on the east side of the street. In my particular situation, the earlier proposal east sidewalk placement would virtually eliminate any ability to park cars in my half circular front driveway. This is quite unfair to impose this type of hardship on me or my neighbors when the west side of the street is very via is a very viable option. I'm hoping the city will respect the views of the local South Spring residents who pay considerable taxes on the street and not be dictated by special interest voices who have little slash no direct interest in our neighborhood. neighborhood. Thanks very much for your consideration. Thank you, Commissioner Clark. Thanks, Mayor. Uh, city Manager, if you could just clarify one more time. Uh, typically, we don't approve sidewalks. We typically approve sidewalk funding. Uh, I know uh, within the last couple meetings, we didn't approve any sidewalks to go in, but we approved sidewalk funding um, out by Sunset Beach and neighborhoods that don't have sidewalks off Keystone Road that need connectivity, that don't have connectivity on sidewalks. So would this come back, did I understand that correctly, would this come back for funding approval? Um, okay, it would come back for funding approval. Yeah. Okay. Um, so at that point, public comment would happen then at that point too, right? Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Um, and then also, um, just a couple other questions for clarification. Um, the city already put together a study to show that there's a significant amount of easement, correct? Yeah. Okay. Um, and then uh, there was a question um, that the, um, I forgot your name already, I'm sorry. Miss Lindsay had, um, city attorney, and I, I would be happy to, to support um, her question. Uh, to you if you could help uh, elaborate a little bit further on that. Okay, so, th so the answer to the question is, is that you're never totally prohibited from readdressing a situation that has come to you in the past. The idea of the motion for reconsideration is to address it timely. So, um, you know, the five months or six months that has passed, you know, there uh, things may have changed. Um, thoughts may have changed, your commission has changed, uh, you have two new commissioners on board, and you cannot tie the hands from commission to commission on any particular project. Um, and I would also liken it to, if you had made a decision not to pave a road, does that mean that for now and forever that you can never pave that road? You could never extend a potable water line because you decided at one point not to do it, you cannot put in a stormwater uh, system, you cannot build a water plant because someone in the past has decided at this commission level that they were not interested at that particular time. I don't, I don't think that in the real world, um, you know, that is something that uh, would, would prevent you from, um, you know, hearing again. And, you know, and I, I know I was probably here at that meeting, but I don't remember the specific motion that was made. Um, so I'm not sure if it was sub substantively the same thing that was addressed at the meeting two weeks ago. Um, but, and that may be another reason to reconsider. It wasn't sub substantively exactly the same. So, yeah, hopefully that will answer your question. Could we read so, the motion? I think, excuse me? Could we read the motion since we don't, it's in our backup? Uh, so I, I think just with uh, the combination of um, hearing the city manager, this is gonna be coming back for funding that there's really no additional comments right now to be made. Um, it's gonna be back at, um, amongst the commission for additional discussion and the public can either share thoughts forward or against it at that time. Um, but, but it's gonna be a public hearing, it'll be noticed. Um, I know there's some discussions about underhanding some other aspects, that's not the case. Um, this is a corridor that's used by a lot of residents in Tarpon Springs. There's a lot of easement in this area uh, growing up in Tarpon Springs, this is a safety issue. Uh, we've talked about the rocks across the street. It was a mistake to install the rocks, in my opinion. Um, but this is the best situation we have right now to address the safety concern. Um, so, that's all I have to say. Commissioner Clark, uh, 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 Yeah, I want to say I really appreciate all the public comment tonight. Um, again, I don't believe that anything was underhanded or lacked transparency. I believe that it was a common sense issue. Uh, it was a safety issue, and it's honestly routine for the city to look at our available easements and connect sidewalks. Uh, it was a safety issue for the pedestrians that, that go around the bayou. 
Um, and, and honestly, I don't, I don't see it as a hardship um, to have a, a sidewalk within the city easement in your front yard. Um, but again, I'm, I'm always available to, to take a call or, or talk about this further, and, and you guys will have another opportunity for public comment when it comes up for funding. Thank you. Thank you. I heard the word underhanded. I don't think anyone here on the commission has ever done that. I think everybody's very honest here. We're here because we want to serve the people. We want to serve you. And we're doing our best to actually provide you with the best service possible. And um, first of all, I want to thank all of you for being here tonight and waiting this long. And also like to thank everybody who called me. And many people expressed their um, concern about safety of the pedestrians. A lot of people are jogging on the street. I agree that uh, the appropriate place for a sidewalk would have been on the uh, west side of the street, but because those rocks have been placed, which was a terrible design, but this is what we have to work with now. We have an issue right now, which is a safety issue. We need to connect those sidewalks in order to provide safety to the people. I, I heard the, uh, the comment that it, some people are gonna have the yards to be smaller. Well, the property where the sidewalk is going to be built, it is a, is, it's a city property. It's not owned by any, any individual one. And that's the city's responsibility to provide safety. This is one of our biggest responsibilities that we have as elected officials is to provide safety. So, and again, I want to thank you and sympathize for uh, uh, not not to, uh, for not for you don't like the decision that I was made, but uh, it was not underhanded. And again, everybody here on the board are very they're doing the best to provide you with the best service as possible. Thank you. Do you want to comment? I I was just going to say. Um, to bring back what the motion was, was to move forward with the designs of the uh, sidewalk on the east side. Um, yeah. Although it would be preferable to, to cover up the riprap, but uh, yeah. that motion was made for to move forward for the design. So that means that we, uh, we will be spending money and time to do that, right? Rather than discussing anything on the west side. Do we have any motion on the floor? Do I have a motion on the floor? No motion to die. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is item number 29, the website, Commissioner Donovan. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'm actually gonna need the PowerPoint, uh, the board up for this. Uh, and I'd encourage um, the mayor and, and commissioners, if you guys would look at the PowerPoint rather than the packet, just because some of the stuff uh, I'm going to discuss has to do with color and style, and in our packet it's just black and white. Um, is there a uh, an on button or a remote that I can use to, to get this up and running? Somebody on the dais. On the dais. Is it on the dais? Or to the right of the projector, it looks like. There you go. Uh, and actually, would it be okay? Um, I think the city manager can answer this. Can I get up there to do it so that I can face the screen and present it? You can. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Commissioners. I'm excited to take a look at improving our city website. I put together this PowerPoint. It uh, consists just of simple pictures of our website and different options, um, hopefully possible solutions, just so that you know, we're basing it off of something that's feasible and local and what other municipalities are doing with their website. So this is our current website. If you look at our home screen, <coughs> excuse me, if you look at our home screen, it's 
full of hyperlinks. Uh, it's really colorless. The two sidebars take up a third of the screen, and they're just gray sidebars that don't have any content or purpose. They actually also blend in with the overall header. Um, I, also, the <coughs> excuse me, the hyperlinks that consist on the website are incoherent. Um, all those hyperlinks you see, the, the picture on the right is just scrolled down on the home screen. So that's the current home page of our city website. So we get the welcome to Tarvin Springs. We have some nice pictures up there. We have, I believe it's um, holiday closings for the city and then just sporadic hyperlinks from there. So it's really disorganized and it's not user friendly and the, the primary goal of a website in my eyes is the least clicks possible. If I'm a resident and I'm accessing my city website, I wanna get to where I'm going, I wanna find out what I need to find out and I don't believe that our current website puts our residents or users in the best position to do that. So this is further on a website. This is actually in a, in a different department entirely. Uh, I believe it's uh, the building department. This left picture that you'll see up there, um, I, I screen capped it. It's again, just a bunch of incoherent hyperlinks. And then actually when you scroll over the hyperlink, it disappears. It blends in with the gray background of the link so you can't even see what you're about to click on. Um, I then went to a different section of our website, and, and they're all pretty much like our online services picture you see there. It's plenty of hyperlinks, no real direction, uh, looks like it's on the back of a, a Word document. So this is, an, this is an example going forward. This is Clearwater's website. This is just an option. Um, note the colors and the simplicity of the layout. The city is prominent on the top left along with their city slogan. And it's also presented with the backdrop of a local picture of their downtown. It's colorful, it's neat, and it's simple. So the three things to highlight here are the buttons, work, live, play. So obviously, if you just go back to our website, it's all gray, there's a bunch of different subheadings, full of links. This website is simple. There's no scrolling down here, this is just it. And if you click on these buttons based on what you're there to do, it changes a sidebar on the left. So this is work. So you can see apply for a building permit, apply for employment, invitation to bid. If I clicked on play, I would see beach parking, parks and recreation, special events calendars, um, marinas. And then if I clicked on live, I would see my utility bill payment, solid waste collection, uh, council meetings and agendas, stuff for residents. <coughs> So this is a different option to consider. Um, this is Dunedin's website. This is about as simple as it gets, at least when you first open the page. It's literally just uh, a picture from Honeymoon Island. Up there you can see kind of what I th believe is the same consultant, or at least the same type of people building these city websites for our surrounding cities. Because you can also see the live, work, play subheading over there. And when you scroll over it, it's pretty much the same exact thing as what Clearwater is doing but it's just layered differently. So if you scroll down on the Dunedin website, uh, you'll see community news, um, you'll see city meetings, you'll see different public events, and it, again, it's just a simple three bar design. It looks neat, it looks professional. You also have agenda and minutes. Those are permanent up there, so that way if anybody wants to pay their utility bill or access past meetings, they just have to click on that. But you can scroll through the news, meetings, events, the events calendar I really like, that's actually interactive completely. So if I click on any different dates or I can click on a whole different set of dates, it'll tell me what's going on when. So moving forward again, this is another different unique option that comes from another local mu municipality. So this is Largo. Again, you got the simple, picturesque, wide design, your community of choice. And this one features a uh, search bar and it's really prominent. Uh, and again, right below that, you got the same theme, live, work, play. And again, does the same exact thing. If you live there, you click on that one, you can pay your bills, whatever. You work, you can receive bids. Um, if you scroll down a little bit on this Largo site, so again, this is what it looks when you open it up, but if you scroll down a little bit, you'll see that they have a few more buttons. Um, that's a little overly stylish, in my opinion, because they got the curve buttons that kind of confused me, but. They do have the city news down there that actually just links to local news sources and their website. And if you keep looking into the search bar, which again is the first, that's their marquee thing. It's the I want to find. 
I wanted to see if it worked because in my experience, a lot of city websites and municipal websites, when you look up anything in a search bar, it, it never works, at least not appropriate. You'll get an error or something like that. It actually did work very well. I typed in building permit, it took me right to building services. You see permits, uh, frequently asked questions, and inspections. And I tried it with a couple other different options and it, it actually does work very well. So again, I wanna have a discussion about our website, how we can do better format-wise, functionality, style, colors, least clicks possible. But really, we owe it to our residents to have a better website. I mean, look at these pictures from other websites. Look at the home page that you pull up. You got Largo right here. It's an awesome sunset in Largo. You got Dunedin. They got pictures of their nature. You can all scroll through different pictures of downtown Dunedin's in there. You got Clearwater, bright and beautiful. And their website's bright and beautiful. And then you come to Tarpon Springs, and frankly, it looks like something that happened a few decades ago. Um, and there's something to be said for the simplicity of it. And I understand that from a data entry point, we, we need those links on there. But I just think there's a much better way to compile them. So anyway, I just want to open up for discussion and possibly direction on what the commission would like to see, whether or not we want to redo our website, whether or not we just want to look at different pricings for different consultants to do it, whether or not it would even be feasible to have something be done in-house. Um, so I just want to open up for discussion. And I'll go back to my seat. Okay. Great job, Commission Donovan. Uh, I agree with you. Our website is not user friendly at all. If you if you look for the uh, the charter, as I was looking the other day, it was difficult to find it. Uh, and uh, I discussed it with Mr. Liquoris, and if I remember right, he was telling me that he was looking a designer or was thinking about doing something with that. Correct. Well, yes, I think I've told you several times. And first of all, I've tried to instill it in my staff that this is nothing against them because we had some people work very hard yeah. to make this simplistic website. And the reason we did it on our own instead of like Dunedin and Clearwater did, I'm getting the pricing now, but I remember the pricing it costs. So in our past budgets, we've had, we haven't had that money. Um, to do that, so we still did something in-house that was functional, and obviously we all agree that, yeah, it's not like the rest of the websites, but we're not spending between thirty-five and $60,000 to do it now. Now, that may be an option. Um, what I told you I want to look at and see with our expertise or maybe getting some if there's a way we can improve it in-house, but it may be a time and budget when we're looking at the different things that that group of money that you have to do either on projects beautifications it may be it may be the time that if we can't make it look like you want it to do that we have to bite the bull in budget because it's simply a matter of budget and this it costs the maintenance of it i think dunedin's maintenance when i talk to them is 10 or eleven thousand a year just for the maintenance of the website i think every time you change it there's a fee um, we're getting that we're getting that information back up, but when we looked at it before and decided to go, our, it was purely cost and the inability to have it budgeted to do. But the two things I want to look is what can we do in house, or maybe bring somebody in to help us to see what we can do, and then present that to you. And if that's not going to be what you want, then we have to look in this budget and and we'll have to bring you the cost to budget um, what these cities. Pay. And it's hard. I know. I know it's going to be hard with Clearwater's, because I know they spent over a hundred thousand dollars. But I don't know. They probably did some more things in there than the website. So when we get theirs, we're going to have to kind of break it down to try to get what exactly was the website portion. Because I believe remembering when we look back before, they did other things besides the website. And also, I think a lot of their cost was was moving the information over to the new website, but. But we'll go back and look at some of those things to look at what the other cities have done. We'll look at what we can do, as I think I told you last time I talked to you. We're working simplistically, but kind of on the website for the Explore Tarpon. We want to kind of see how that looks like. Um, but we'll look at those different options and bring it back to you. And maybe one of those things we talk in one of our budget meetings that, uh, you know, it is time to find the money and bring in the professionals to to do it and stuff, I'll try to get some other options because again, there's going to be recurring costs. If we want anything changed, that's that's a fee. So it, it might be just what you're going to do, but we'll see what we can do 
um, on our end, and if there's someone we can bring in to help us, I'd rather us be able to manage it than be under the control of somebody we can't really give money to, but if it's not possible, then we may have to go the other route. Yeah, Mr. LaCourious, thank you, and I remember this very well. Uh, the uh, website was created in-house at a time when we had, it was difficult economic period, and it was a service purpose. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, when the uh, the website was created, it was not that much information as this is defined, but at the time it went by, many things went got to the website, now it's time to look. Just well, like we, you said, we all know, uh, uh, again, like we did hard work, but we also know yeah. there's a better product out there to put up there, yeah. so we, we realize that also. And uh, Commissioner Donovan, I would appreciate you uh, providing the input of, uh, of your idea. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Yeah, and again, I mean, I, I know, you know, Tarpon Springs is unique. I think we can improve on these ideas. You know, we're not Clearwater, we're not Dunedin, yeah. we're not Largo. I just want to throw these out there so that you could see kind of the scale of where other cities are at. Sure. And I just think we're really falling behind in this. So, again, I mean, I, I know I want to see the pricing, of course, um, and whether or not it would be feasible to do something in-house again or, or what we can do. But, I mean, if we can get creative, the more creative, the better. I mean, I'm, I'm still open to seeing a bunch of options. I'm sure me, Mr. Lucrez will know what kind of expertise that we have. If it can be done in-house, we could. If not, I guess we have to go outside to look for it. Commissioner Carr. Thanks, Mayor. Uh, yeah, thanks, uh, Commissioner Donovan, for bringing this forward. Um, uh, I do want to thank staff for their um, diligence to update the website. Um, it is a simple click here website. That, yeah. Um, I've received a lot of unsolicited comments about our website in the <laughs> past, too, um, just how it's difficult to, to navigate uh, at times. Um, and I, I, there is an appreciation as well, though, that there's the hyperlinks in the very front to where you just go straight to the news if we have something we could just throw on there. But um, I think it would be good just to have like a news tab and then you click on that tab at the front and then you get into all the details, right, that you could go into. So uh, I do think this is a good idea to uh, redesign. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of templates that you could buy or just go onto the template website, they're not very expensive. We don't have to necessarily pay, or the city doesn't necessarily pay a, a designer for a website, so that might be a good alternative to That's see as we well. Yes. Um, is some templates that are available, and there's like a monthly domain or monthly um, servicing. Uh, or even if you do use a designer, um, I think we have a, a communications um, staff member that could still update the website um, and manage it from that staff level that we wouldn't, as a city, the city wouldn't have to pay to um, have it updated regularly or something right. along those lines. But right. I'm in favor of uh, looking at a design option and uh, continuing to move us forward. I do like this sponger. Um, I do like some of the pictures that are there. Uh, they could be utilized uh, maybe better and a better design. So I'm looking forward to see what's going to come forward. Beautiful picture. Mark. I think it's Mark, isn't it, up there? In the <laughs> Mr. Stuber. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Connor. And I do want to recognize our staff. I think it was a couple of years ago only that we uh, redid our website and Suzanne worked hard on it. And so I want to make sure that they are recognized. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I, I can always see improvement. I don't want to lose our culture and not have our sponge diver on our website. <laughs> so I think we need to keep you know that in mind with Tarpon Springs is, is what our culture is. But uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing what you come up with, Mark, that we may be able to use some of these ideas and work on it in-house without spending $100,000 uh, on a designer and, and, and uh, the upkeep. So thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Donovan, have any comments? Any more? Uh, no, no, yeah. none further. Okay. Well, thank you again for uh, bringing it forward. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Uh, the next item, item number 30, internship program. Commissioner Donovan. Uh, yeah, and thank you, Mark, for letting me kind of sandwich two two agenda items together back to back here in an already long meeting. Um, so I'll try to be as as brief as possible. Uh, I want to discuss the possibility of creating an unpaid internship that would focus on commissioners mentoring students that are passionate about public service. So what I ended up doing was I reached out to the St. Petersburg College Public Policy and Administration Program, of which I'm a graduate. Um, and, I, and I just asked them, I said, hey, I know you do a lot of different partnerships with different cities in terms of internships, but this is just a unique idea that, that I had and I think might be feasible. Uh, would, you, would you be willing to participate? And they were just absolutely thrilled. 
Um, I mean, so many of these college students are so passionate about public service, um, and they could really use kind of a guiding force um, in their life and just somebody to bounce different questions off of. So not only is this an opportunity to collaborate with our local college and help shape future community leaders, uh, but this will also help, hopefully, um, possibly have our, our city attract new employees uh, that are qualified with degrees um, and, and can be kind of exposed to what our city's all about. Um, so I, I made this little city commission internship, um, I guess, uh, pamphlet or application. Uh, I'm not really sure what you would want to call it. I won't read all of it, um, but I will just go over the highlights for um, people watching. Uh, this internship will give Tarpon Springs City Commissioners the opportunity to mentor students that are in the St. Petersburg College Public Policy and Administration Program. Participating and choosing to mentor a student is completely optional. If a commissioner chooses to mentor a student, they may determine their own meeting times and what they would like the student to do. But I just want to really um, kind of reiterate that it's, it's totally optional. So if a commissioner has a busy schedule or they don't you know, want to have to deal with an intern or a mentorship, then, then you don't have to. It's just an option that, that commissioners can, can take up. And it's also unpaid. So the objectives of the internship would be to provide an opportunity for elected officials to mentor future community leaders, provide students with valuable public service experience that will enhance their skills and ability. And it goes on to list some more. The student responsibilities would include largely what the individual commissioner would like to do. Um, off the top of my head, the first things I thought of were to participate in the research and study of upcoming agenda items and various city issues, attend city commission meetings and work sessions, engage in weekly meetings with their commissioner regarding public service, city issues, career goals, and general questions that they may have about public administration or public office. Uh, again, there's, there's a few more on there, but I'll move to student timing. I was thinking it'd be eight weeks. Um, that's half a semester for most colleges. Um, it could be more or less, uh, I'm open to discussion on it, and I, I threw in there, it'd probably be about three to 10 hours of work per week, um, including outside independent research if a commissioner wanted to let them in on kind of their process on how they go about reading and studying up on the agenda items. Uh, qualifications are pretty simple. Be enthusiastic about the field of public service and have a strong interest in city government. Be a student of the SPC public policy and administration program. And then I added a little parentheses in here because eventually I'd like to see the same thing be done with the Tarpon Springs High School. Um, but I guess for the first step, we could collaborate with the college because those are students that have already chosen their major. We know that they're passionate about this. And then if that goes over well, then we can possibly reach out to the high school and, and see if they'd like to join as well. Um, and then the application process, again, very simple. I'll just submit a resume and cover letter. Please mention why you are interested in local government and what skills you hope to develop. And then the individual commissioners can select their students based off resumes or cover letters or however they want to do it. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll toss it up for discussion, criticism, um, ideas, whatever you guys think. Another good one, Commissioner Donovan. Thank you. Uh, my uh, recommendation with that is, and, and I'm glad already uh, that you already spoke to uh, uh, to the people of the um, St. Petersburg College. Uh, the provost, Dr. Davis, he will love this program. I know that he's always like to get, to get involved with the uh, with the city. Uh, just in addition to what uh, you were talking about, they're thinking to. Um, the, the college is thinking of creating a program with a major in public service to provide um, to provide um, employees <coughs> for uh, uh, the city position. Uh, this is still in the uh, designing stage. They haven't uh, went forward with that, uh, but they are uh, thinking very seriously to do that. So I think combined with that, it's going to be a good program. What I'd like to suggest to Mr. LeCourse is to see how many students you can support or something like this, and how many, uh, you know, what can you do with it, you know? We don't want to get a lot of students and then not being able to uh, uh, to support them. Mm -hmm. Over to you. Well, again, you know, the commissioners, the way this is set, you know, you would be the ones who would take them on. Now, what I want to say to you, and obviously I've worked with, with the group that he talks about at the college. I've gone down and, sp and sp spoken to them in career. So what I'd like to offer up also is that for you commissioners who have busy work schedule and you look at this and say, geez, the whole eight weeks, um, the times that you can't 
meet with a person or the weeks that are bad, I would be glad to take over and myself and staff um, for consistency. Because I know some of you may be worried about, about taking this on because of work. But we'd be glad, I myself or my staff would be glad to fill the gaps to you um, um, to go to it. That's so, one of the reasons we call it consistent support. Okay. I know some of the clinicians, like you yeah. say, they're very busy. So. Well, again, I, I, you know, I support this completely. Again, I've worked with a public policy group and wanted to expand it, and this is the perfect way to do it. So, um, again, we can take it on and take on the students that, that, that you as commissioners want to sponsor, and then we can go from there. Well, I can speak for myself that I'm always available for that. Commissioner Carr. Thanks, uh, Connor, uh, Commissioner Donovan, thanks for bringing this up. Uh, great idea again. Um, as a college student, uh, not too long ago, um, obviously you're closer to that than I am now, uh, you always look for opportunities um, to get your foot in the door for experience or you're looking for opportunities to just gain um, some real life experience. And I think this is a great opportunity for some students here locally to see how their local government runs. And um, although it would be difficult to spend um, or the commitment with my schedule, I mean, I could figure it out at times to do this um, with a student. Obviously, it wouldn't be consecutively throughout the year, but I could break some time away to do that as well. Um, and it's encouraging that city staff is willing to help as well with that too. So I'm in, I'm in support of this. I think it's a great idea. Um, any, any way we could help um, shape somebody to get in public service, uh, I would completely support. Yeah, I think it's a great idea, uh, Connor. Uh, and my question was to Mark, because uh, also, as, as you mentioned, um, the time for Mark and, and our city staff and, and department heads to, uh, to, to be able to have uh, with these students, you know, that that's agreeable with you. Um, I think a great idea, I mean, a lot of this stuff that you're talking about covering is in Citizens Academy. Um, and I would encourage these students to also participate in Citizens Academy because they do learn how our city functions uh, with that program, and it's a great program. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, yeah. Um, yeah, and I, I think Citizens Academy is a fantastic program, and we could definitely encourage them to, to do that as well. Um, another thing I wanted to reiterate is that it would largely be up to the commissioner or, or the mayor or vice mayor, however they wanted to do it. So you could say, hey, let's meet Monday for an hour at, at City Hall and we can talk. Um, or you could say, hey, I'm really stacked this week. Uh, we can FaceTime or do a phone call or something like that. I mean, largely I want to leave it independent, commissioner to commissioner, because every commissioner has a different schedule, different priorities, different things that they're doing. Um, so again, with your guys kind of recommendation saying yeah let's let's move forward with this I can work further with the college um, on kind of crafting this because I met with them I bounced these ideas by them they were all for it but I can hammer out a more detailed I guess kind of specification of, of everything um, and bring it back to you guys uh, and I, I can work with Mark on that as well and again I appreciate um, you kind of sparing some of the department heads times and, and your own time to work with these kids Any public comments on this item? Well, that concludes the agenda tonight, and we go to the staff comments. Chief? No comments, Mayor. Thank you. Tom? Yeah, I just wanted to bring to your attention Section 2-157 of your code in relation to Resolution 2019-19 that, that failed tonight. This was the conditional use application for storage trust since it was a 2-2 split, your code specifically provides, and I'll just read it under section 2-157 for NC, in the event that there is a tie vote, the matter shall be considered in equipose and shall be placed on the next regular meeting for re reconsideration. So you're gonna hear the storage trust case again um, when uh, you have a full board. So when you see it on your agenda, that's the reason why your code requires it. It would have to have it. Um, it needs to be a notice the same way that the previous meeting was noticed. So the answer is yes. Thank you. That's all I have. Thank you. Yeah. Mr. McCoy. No, sir. Madam Senior Clerk. Yeah. Nothing. Commissioner Carr. 
Thanks, Mayor. Uh, just want to reiterate, uh, tonight we talked about uh, scholarships for students at Tarpon Springs High School and at St. Pete College for the art students. And then we, um, Commissioner Donovan brought up also the internship for St. Pete College as well. Uh, I'm encouraged as a board that we're looking for avenues to speak into students' lives and helping student lives um, in our community and our area. So I just want to reiterate that and say a uh, great job to everybody. Thank you. Commissioner Schuber? Yes, uh, I just want to remind everyone that we have Night in the Islands uh, this Saturday on the Sponge Talks. Hope you all make it out there. Thanks. <laughs> None for me, Mayor. Thank you. Comment? Okay, I have some announcements to make. Uh, Commissioner Sieber already said about the Night of the Islands, but uh, we also have the same day, Saturday, June 29th, the uh, Family Double Dare from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. at the Community Center. And this is hosted by our uh, recreation department. July 4th, we have the picnic in the park that begins at 10 a.m., 2 p.m. Um, Mr. LeCurse is going to have, I'm sure, a lot of barbecue and a lot of games for the, uh, for the, for the kids, correct? Good barbecue hot dogs. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. <laughs> okay. And we also have uh, July 4th, we got the fireworks. Uh, the best place to view them is at the uh, Howard Park. Friday, July 5th is the uh, first Friday. That begins at 6 p.m. to 10 p.m. I can't believe it's been a month already. Mm -hmm. um, well, that concludes our regular session, and it's adjourned at 10.38 p.m. <laughs>